The meeting of the committee um, advises uh, that the meeting is being streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that any audio visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and your, any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published, or published publicly by council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council likes to acknowledge that we're meeting on a traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and that we pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge they are continuing importance to the Ghana people here today. We also like to extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and First Nations who are also present with us today. Uh, members, we don't have, uh, we have an apology from Councillor Hind and we also have uh, Councillor Moran that's running slightly late. If I can have a member for item three to move the confirmation of the, mini, of the minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of September 2019, moved by Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Martin. Any debate or discussion on those items of minutes? Okay, be it that there's none, I put that to you. All those in favour, all those against, those minutes are now taken. Members, as you are aware, item five, uh, which was a discussion forum item in confidence with regards to a strategic property matter relating to 88 O'Connell Street has been, has been withdrawn uh, for this meeting, uh, which deals with item six point, sorry, item 5.1, um, that would not be discussed today. It's been withdrawn by administration. Uh, we have first item on the agenda is item 6.1. I'll move uh, the item relating uh, to the trees on the request of Councillor Sims uh, to earlier on the agenda, but with respect to Councillor Moran that is on her way, uh, she's very passionate about that discussion. I will wait for her to be in the chamber before the item is being heard. Uh, with that in mind, um, I will go to item 6.1. We have a short presentation from our administration with regards to the Adelaide Airport Master Plan. And I'll hand over to the CEO to do the relevant introductions. Thanks, thank you. Through you, Chair, thank you. Um, just like to welcome uh, our presenters from the Adelaide Airport um, to the table. Um, we have Kim Mays, Executive General Manager, Planning and Infrastructure, Adelaide Airport Limited and also James Sangster, Executive General Manager, Property Adelaide Airport Limited to present to us tonight. The purpose of this presentation, members, is to um, outline um, Adelaide Airport Limited have released a preliminary master plan for consultation. Uh, this presentation is just intended to enable council members to hear about the master plan and ask some questions uh, direct to the Adelaide Airport staff. And um, just to note, a report with a draft submission uh, will be presented to the committee on the 1st of October that uh, administration will prepare. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and thanks for the opportunity to present to you today on the Adelaide Airport Master Plan. Um, Kim and I will uh, do the frontline presentation, but our other colleagues listed there are sitting in the gallery, should there be any other questions that uh, Kim and I can't uh, respond to adequately. Um, on the slide there, we've just shown the program timeline really for the master plan process. We are sitting uh, around about where that second box is on, or on the left hand side uh, in that we have started public consultation and uh, the presentation tonight constitutes uh, and forms part of our public consultation. What that ultimately leads to is that by the early part of the year next year, our expectation is having gone through the public consultation process, that we will provide to the Federal Minister of Transport our draft master plan uh, in the early part of the year next year. And the Minister then has a period of time to consider that master plan and provide their response um, and we're targeting for that to be around about April next year. This slide sets out uh, the principles and our approach to master planning. This master plan, we master plan every eight years, but we master plan on a 20 year cycle. We have a broader vision for the airport uh, that spans out 30 plus years, but the timeline for this master plan and all of the studies that we do to inform this master plan 
uh, are based over a eight plus then 12 year to make a 20 year uh, cycle. We have very strong alignment in our master planning processes, notwithstanding that we are a federal leasehold uh, owner. Our shareholders um, prioritised or bought the lease from the Commonwealth Government in 1998 on a 100 year lease. Um, and we follow federal planning principles, but we have a very strong alignment with state and local government planning principles. And we've set those that alignment out and the way in which we go about our master planning and our alignment with the state, <coughs> excuse me, and local uh, planning protocols, which we've, we've set that out in our master plan document. The master plan really represents for us uh, a, the basis of what could occur over the period of time that we're forecasting if a number of assumptions come to pass. If those assumptions don't come to pass, then what we set out in our master plan may not occur, but it is our best forward estimate given a, a range of independent technical studies that we do around traffic forecasting, passenger traffic forecasting, aircraft movements, ground transport, road transport, forecasting. We combine all of that and that's what produces the forecasts that we, we show in our master plan. And I'll just set out some of those forecasts now. Presently, the economic contribution of Adelaide Airport equates to around 3% of gross state product, $2.9 billion. And full-time employment, either directly on airport or associated related employment, to the activities that take place at Adelaide Airport account for around about 22,000 full-time equivalent jobs. That's as of today. We are predicting that in 2039, over the 20-year time frame of the master plan to the great contribution of gross state product to rise to around about $7.5 billion with 56,000 full-time equivalent jobs created as a consequence of the activities at the airport. And I have very briefly set out in the bottom right hand uh, infographic there, the, uh, the shareholders of Adelaide Airport, they are primarily uh, superannuation funds. And we have five shareholders um, and you can see the range of the shareholders that are there and their interests in Adelaide Airport lease. Other forecasts over the journey of 20 years, we presently have eight and a half million passengers per annum. That, go through the gateway to South Australia, go through the gateway airport. Um, there, that is looking to rise to just under 20 million in 20 years time. To put that in context, that's about the equivalent of Brisbane airport today. Freight is extremely important to the sustainability of airlines that operate out of the airport. It's not just about passenger traffic, traffic it's very, very much about the freight that can go in the undercarriage of aircraft, international aircraft, um, to and from Adelaide Airport. And in that regard, I think it's important to note that of the nine international airlines that we have flying into Adelaide with eight destinations, there are some 300 plus destinations around the world with one stop, very convenient transfers. So what that means is freight and people can get to their destinations out of Adelaide very quickly and very reliably given the coverage and the scope of the airline um, uh, schedule that we have out of the airport, but they do need that so combination of freight and passengers to, to uh, make their operations uh, sustainable. Our development objectives in setting out master planning I, I set out there. I, I won't read all of those out for, for the sake of time, um, but uh, I, I already have covered the amount of technical studies that inform our master plan, that these are the objectives that we, uh, we, we set out to achieve in every aspect of the master planning. The little triangle infographic up in the top uh, left-hand corner there really sets out the, the broad principles, and that is, we are very, very focused on providing a great customer experience. Our master plan retains innovation and flexibility for future technologies, and we're very focused on maintaining and improving our sustainability. Airport safeguarding um, is an important part of master planning. Every one of those considerations shown on that slide, which, which comprise the, the uh, uh, national airport safeguarding framework cover, uh, we, we consider every one of these aspects when we look at developments on airport and we are um, 
uh, we're very focused on, on seeing these types of uh, principles encompassed into state and local government planning, planning rules, and that is um, beginning to take effect. Our, I've set out here just our timeline really from, from here to, through to the close of public consultation. We've had a series of open days. We have more to come. These are public open days, some at the airport, some at our local um, West Torrens City Council uh, chambers. We have uh, a lot of information on our website and we look for public uh, contribution via the website. We have a series of other uh, paraphernalia which we produce, some of which you have here now, fact sheets and, and so on, that draw out the more uh, important aspects of the master plan. But we're very much focused on getting as much public consultation as we can, as many submissions as we can, and therefore um, we're looking forward to the Council's uh, submission uh, by the close of public consultation, which is in October uh, this year. That really covers master planning, and I thought in the one remaining minute um, I might cover our terminal expansion. We're very excited by it. We're very proud of what this will bring to Adelaide Airport, but more importantly, uh, properly representing and continuing to, to properly represent the state of South Australia through, through what we can do uh, at the terminal. This expansion is primarily and principally about creating a improved customer experience for international arrival and departure passengers, um, but it's also taking the opportunity to significantly expand our retail and our dining options for both domestic and international passengers. And pleasingly, one thing that we've, that has been recently announced is the opportunity now for us to incorporate into this terminal expansion a very much treasured uh, aviation asset, and that is the Vickers Vimy aircraft, which is celebrating 100 years of the first uh, flight from uh, Great Britain to Australia. And there's a number of uh, uh, ceremonies and recognitions for the aircraft throughout the year this year. And uh, we're very much looking forward uh, in the, by the middle of 2021, incorporating that aircraft into this uh, new terminal expansion where it will feature prominently for the public and uh, be in a very, very good home for uh, the next good period of time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'll now just refer to elected members uh, if they have any questions they would like to ask with regards to the presentation today. <coughs> Councillor Martin. Yeah, just a, a couple of quick uh, questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, as a representative of people in North Adelaide who have uh, a, um, a relationship with the airport because of the flight path, um, is this the opportunity for people in that area to make any submission to um, um, this um, this master planning process, or is that something that rests with another authority? Uh, no, this is an opportunity to make whatever submissions uh, uh, people would like to. There's extensive coverage around the way in which we model aircraft movements and the way in which noise footprint and the noise contours are planned out and projected over the next 20 years, and we invite submissions on that. And is this also the opportunity for people to make submissions about the possibility of a second parallel runway to Vine 23? Uh, the master plan does um, uh, contemplate um, uh, the runway in this sense, um, and that is that it is well beyond the period of uh, this master plan before a uh, second parallel runway is what I think you're referring to. There are already two runways. Uh, well, there's, there's actually four runways, but um, that's a technical problem. Um, a second parallel runway uh, is not contemplated in this master plan other than to say that the flexibility and the optionality for it is retained. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Kerr. Thanks, Chair. Just really just a comment. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think uh, if, if there's anything uh, that uh, might be um, useful for uh, city councillors to be aware of in terms of uh, things the airport or things that are seen as desirable for the airport in terms of the ingress and egress uh, through the city corridor uh, that, uh, uh, that falls within the boundary of Adelaide City Council, um, we're all ears. Please contact us. 
uh, email us, et cetera. New councillors will be happy to be uh, brought up to speed on any of those uh, elements. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Any other questions? <coughs> any questions for Mike? Or Mike or should we conclude? Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and the presentation to this evening to this committee. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, uh, Councillor Moran is still not with us, and I'm mindful of the people in the gallery. I might deal with one more item and give her the chance to get here in that time to be able to deal with some of the uh, some of the other items of concern to the public on the agenda. Be it that that's the case, I will uh, deal with item 6.3 for the time being, which is the future of heritage, uh, with regards um, to this committee, and I'll ask members of the team to please join us. Thank you. I'll hand over to the CEO. Shanti, can you lead us through? Thanks. Uh, through the chair, thank you, members, um, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to come and present to you this evening a uh, piece of work that's um, been um, we've been working on it in the background for some time now. The thing that members um, should be made aware of is the City of Adelaide has had uh, a proud history of looking after its heritage that dates back to the early 1980s. Um, we actually had a celebration of 30 years of um, the city, city of Adelaide actually formally, formally having a program of heritage management. Uh, back in uh, 1987, Council adopted a full raft of policies uh, to ensure that its heritage was um, protected, promoted, um, and in fact celebrated. So, um, given that we had a celebration of 30 years of that, that work back in uh, 2018, we felt it appropriate to actually put heritage on a new footing. And so really the purpose of, um, mind the pun, the purpose of tonight's presentation is for Robin and Rick to present um, some of the, the thinking um, that we as an administration have come up with um, to take us beyond that 30 year uh, period that we've already celebrated. So what does the future for looking after heritage in the city look like, number one? Um, number two are some of the thoughts that we've come up with, do they, do they sit well with you? Have we missed anything? Um, and Essentially, it is to, um, I guess, put the City of Adelaide back on its pedestal as a leader in the in the protection and conservation of heritage uh, in Australia. I'll hand over to Rick. Thank you, Rick. Okay, thank you, Shanti, and thank you, members. Um, so, if I can introduce. Um, to members Robin Taylor, who is a senior heritage policy or senior policy officer in our team, um, has extensive experience in heritage and has been leading this piece of work um, within our team, but also across council, because we do know that heritage sits right across, I guess, what we do, council business, it sits right across our four strategic themes. So this is a piece of work that affects all of council. Um, so if I can quickly go through um, Presentation. Shanti's given a, a background of where um, where we've been and I guess where we want to go. Um, and you have in your papers some detail around um, some of the history of the program, the value of heritage as we understand it. What we see is some of the emerging themes and challenges of how we manage our heritage moving forward. Um, but tonight we wanted to get members' feedback around these four four key ideas of. Um, Tried and true, which is really building on the foundations of our program. So we see much of what we do um, continues to be of importance um, in, in how we manage our heritage fabric moving forward. The idea of pursuing world heritage listing, um, the idea of refocusing somewhere that's around um, from in, focus on individual places to looking at how do we how do we manage and celebrate the places within the city as, a, as an area, and then how do we share our I guess wealth and huge repository of heritage information that we do have. So if I move, but just very briefly, just going back over the program, just to add a little bit more to what Shanti has touched on in terms of what the program has delivered over 30 years. Um, and the program has really been operated under three, three key pillars around protecting our heritage, preserving our heritage and promoting our heritage. And each of those has Last 30 years continues and has delivered some outstanding 
results. So in terms of protecting our, our heritage, we, as a result of the program, we have around two and a half thousand listed buildings and places across the city of Adelaide, which is around 27% of the state's listed heritage fabric. Um, council has invested uh, more than $20 million um, in the heritage incentive scheme and grants over that period. And one example here, which you can see the works, the outcomes of those projects do change, um, visible, have a visible impact on our streetscape. So that's a, a property in Waymouth Street that was supported through the Heritage Incentive Scheme. Um, and then lastly, our, our promotions program. This is one that's a really exciting opportunity we see moving forward. It's, um, it's a growing area um, with the advent of social media and other opportunities. We see the opportunities are a great, a great place for council. Um, this, the photo here is from the 30 year celebration with a number of cubes in the, um, which were placed in the mall and online. Um, one of the highest reaches of a, of a social media campaign council came from this, which was linked with um, telling the story really of, of the history of the city linked, linked to our heritage. So if I move on briefly to the, the ideas, just to provide a bit more detail of what we see they, they may deliver. Um, so try and true about building on the foundation. So the protect, preserve, promote, we see will continue moving forward, but sort of into that a bit further, we, it's a critical role we see in that of how do we monitor, research, analyze and critique the heritage system and also push for change as part of, part of that. Council has been an active voice in that place and we see we have a role to continue that. Um, we can see a need to continue to review and augment our heritage places and, and seek new listings, moving into the area of more modern heritage as well over time. Um, how do we develop and deal with strategies to deal with our unlisted, un, underutilised buildings as well as certainly a part of the program which is growing? And I'll come to those other items in, in a moment. Um, the idea of world, world heritage listings, so we know that the Um, the city of Adelaide is, is unique in its history. Um, there has been discussion for some time now around the idea of progressing world, world heritage listing for the city. Um, in 2008, the, the city of Adelaide plan, layout, so the city and parklands plan, was entered onto the national heritage list, which recognises that value. Um, but we see, so, so the research we've done to date, we do see that. Um, we do have the opportunity to meet some of the criteria to pursue the World Heritage Listing. So a couple of, just briefly, a couple of those elements. Um, Adelaide is a city within a park, as we know, rather than a park in a city. Um, from our research, there is no other city in the world um, that does, it does have those characteristics. Um, and in terms of size of the parklands, in particular, those, the parklands are three, three times the size of Central Park, so they are a significant <coughs> to our city. Um, another element, the, the plan is the first example um, in the world of parklands created and then dedicated for public use, so created as a public park. There are some examples um, of open space created as hunting ground or common land in the world, but the, from what we understand it's the first example um, of public park created for the use and enjoyment for the people. Um, I think the, probably the last point now is, I guess, importantly, is that this, the parklands and the city layout has survived and they remain substantially intact. So that is a factor that would support progressing that um, listing opportunity. But what, the, what that might would provide is the opportunity for Adelaide you know, to showcase the qualities as a city, picks up well on um, the council brand of Design for Life, and potentially has a number of other. Um, opportunities around attracting people, visitation, or just around the identity, recognising and celebrating the identity of Adelaide. And the third, third idea is around how do we opportunity to refocus some of our effort from um, conserving and looking at individual places to how do we look at collections of buildings and places. Um, we do. We do have a number of streets and places in our city that could benefit from this approach. Um, some current examples, where at Lee Street is one where a high proportion of buildings that we can see the change that's evolved to that place over time. But we have a whole range of other 
streets and places within our city that have high volumes and high proportions of, of the street frontages that are historic buildings. So Rundle Street, a whole number of minor streets have over 85% of the length of those streets as historic buildings. So how do we move forward and celebrate uh, those places? I'm going to show a video, but I might move. Um, and then the last idea is related to how we share our information. So council does um, hold a great deal of information, particularly about our heritage places and people um, in the form of heritage survey data sheets, photographs and a range of other records. We see a significant opportunity for how we utilise this information for a whole wide range of purposes to tell the history and stories of our city. Um, we know through some of our promotions about the significant uptake when we make that, about, that information available to people or we make that information available ourselves to the community. Um, this would particularly involve how do we digitise our records that can make them available so that people can really access themselves and look at how do they use, use that information for a whole range of opportunities um, around social media, QR codes, I guess business, tourism. You see there's a whole range of things and many that we wouldn't have thought of which um, making the information available would provide those opportunities moving forward. Um, what it also means is if we provide that in the right digital format, the council information can be the first source when people search for that information. So enabling council to position itself well in that space is another opportunity. Um, the opportunity also to partner with organisations that we work closely with in providing that information and working them to deliver a whole range of new, new things that we could celebrate and recognise um, our history. So I think that's probably those four ideas. Just in finishing, we do, Shanti alluded to, do see as a time to review our direction um, or when we need to refocus our approach so we can take our, it's our heritage program forward into the longer term. So, um, so really tonight we, it's brief and there's a, there's a lot of ideas in there. We're seeking your feedback and thoughts on those four ideas. It's also have we missed anything or is there anything you anticipate that we might look at moving forward? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Councillor. So we've got Councillor Martin, um, Councillor Sims, followed Councillor Kerry and the board mayor to ask questions. Please go ahead, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Um, look, uh, it's, um, it's great and I endorse what you're saying about um, sticking with what we've done well and then expanding a little. Take me through why we're advocating uh, World Heritage Listing to uh, complement National Heritage Listing before we wouldn't want to try persuade um, the state to um, provide heritage listing, state heritage listing for the parklands in the city layout. Um, I would see that that all fits together. I'd say this, the, the idea of pursuing World Heritage Listing is something that will take some time to progress, but we would see that having that as a long-term ambition and, and strategic direction um, would give council a position to pursue, I guess, those sorts of things and pursue that idea of state heritage listing as well on the parklands. So what you're saying is as a strategy, a tactic to persuade the state to adopt state heritage listing, we would pursue World Heritage Listing to complement National Heritage Listing and say to them, well, what are you doing? Uh, through the Chair, if I might answer that question, um, the State, um, the State Heritage Branch has actually uh, been working on a, a proposition for listing uh, the park plan, so that is a piece of work that is in train. Um, we don't see this as either complicating or competing um, with that process. That process will follow its own due course that's legislated uh, by the State Heritage Act. Um, 
uh, the World Heritage listing is um, through the UN, so uh, it is a separate process that just gives um, the city and its layout um, and the parklands uh, a completely different lens uh, to be seen through from a world perspective. But as a elected body, we could say to the administration, we think you should uh, pursue state heritage listing with equal vigour as world heritage listing. Uh, through the chair, um, there has been a reporting to council where council has endorsed the proposition around state heritage listing. Thank you, Shanti. Oh, great. So we can expect that to be reflected here as well. Uh, we can reflect that in this document, yes. That's great. And just going to the third idea in terms of shifting the plan a little to involve public realm, are you talking about um, uh, conservation zones or any zone? Um, I think what we're, I think I might play this video off again while we're talking. Um, if we're able to, it's not going to work. Um, I, I would see that the, the key part for the strategy is identifying those places we see have strong heritage value, which we can most tell the story, recognise that in a number of ways. Whether that's through conservation, whether that's through the planning system, or whether that's working how we work across council, so we connect the things that we deliver. Whether it's working with business through business programs, or whether it's public realm improvements, or whether it's a pack, it may well be a package. I would envision that to be a package of those things that might be tailored to the particular area. So I wouldn't necessarily be saying we put all eggs in one basket if you like. Let's look at those things that we do have control over, and then. Part of the solution might be zones or planning zones, um, but it's not necessarily, I guess, reliant from my point, my thinking on, on that. Okay, well, just from my selfish perspective, uh, it would be great if we targeted conservation zones, um, especially not that one. Thank you, Councillor Martin and Councillor Sims, followed by Councillor Kerr, followed by the Lord Mayor. Thanks, Chair, and I wish you a happy birthday. Thank you. I was amongst, going to, I'm amongst all my great friends here. I was going to, going to jump out of what a better way. I was going to jump out of a cake for you, but uh, I didn't have time to organise. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might just give some um, general uh, feedback, if that's um, okay, rather than asking questions. Sure. Um, I really wanted to uh, support the World um, Heritage listing for the parklands. I think um, that's really, really critically important. Um, I understand Council is going to be meeting soon um, with uh, Steve Georgianis, the new member for Adelaide, and um, I'd encourage uh, administration and the Lord Mayor to um, follow this up with um, him because this may be an issue that he can push for us at a federal level. I'm also cognizant of the fact that I think actually as we speak, former Adelaide City Councillor Alex Antic is giving his first speech in the Senate and maybe this is an issue he may well take up um, on Council's behalf as a new Senator for our state. So I'd encourage us to push this at a federal level to get federal members of Parliament to take this up in advance at, um, on our behalf. I think it would be great for our city. Um, in terms of other feedback, the only thing I wanted to add to the general principles that were listed before, I think Council has a, a really important role to play in terms of being a conduit between state government and the community. We do, I think, um, very well reflect the concerns of the community around uh, developments, but I, I think um, there is more work that could be done in terms of consulting with the community and doing regular surveys around potential historic buildings that have not been listed or that are at risk of demolition and being able to then use that information to advocate effectively. Um, because whilst we don't always, we're not always a decision maker in that space, I think we have a really important advocacy role to play. Um, and we do have the resources to be able to do some of that um, surveying and collating of information. So um, I think our role is to take the fight up to the state government to advocate strongly for our residents. Um, so anything that we can do in terms of improving our engagement and consultation through regular surveys so that we can strengthen that advocacy arm, I think it'd be really important. Thank you, Councillor Sims. I'm just for the benefit of um, Councillor Moran, welcome. Sorry, I noticed you walked in a bit earlier. Uh, we haven't dealt with um, two items yet. So the 6.2 North Adelaide parking, uh, all the trees we'll be dealing with later, we're just awaiting your arrival. Um, to Councillor Kerr. 
Thank you. Um, on the uh, making heritage places um, arm that you've got there, um, we uh, I think everyone's in agreement there is there is a shortfall in terms of the number of buildings that are heritage protected in the city. Uh, even a minority of the, um, uh, you know, as you are aware, minority of the uh, uh, Donovan list uh, of buildings um, would, would find, would yield a, a significant number of buildings that are unprotected. Um, how do you see that particular shift in focus from heritage area improvements rather than individual buildings? Um, how does that assist or, or, or does it not at face but you cut against uh, that uh, overarching, um, I think, very clear imperative we've got? Um, I would see they all work in some ways. We would need to look at those and implement them all, all, all together and consider those areas based on a whole range of factors. I think what we'd seek to set out in the strategy is an approach where we, as we work forward, we identify those areas and link a whole range of different programs and things we're doing. Um, that, as, and as part of that, we would consider really the, the stock that's in that street and the like what the status of that stock is and what it means for the future. Um, and I think we'd make decisions as we progress based on that. Um, I think at a high level, the intent presenting now is to the idea of the focus around looking at areas as well as individual places. They, they both happen together. We're not saying we wouldn't look at individual places or individual buildings, but the intent is to focus more around a place-based approach. Thanks. Yeah, that, that was my follow-up question, really. Just so you, this is not going to take away because a heritage and the city, very often it is individual buildings. They they yep. will just be by themselves yep. and they, they desperately need protection uh, and there is no identifiable little area or zone around them. Uh, this is not going to take away from that term. Thank you. Morning. Um, thank you, Chair. And I think that's probably a good example of um, what they mean when they're sort of talking collections of heritage buildings and making place. Um, I, mine's a bit of a, more of a question, just interested in the integration of Ghana uh, history with colonial history and, and heritage and how we might, um, how we're going to try and sort of integrate those two things. <coughs> okay. um, yes, I think we, as part of the discussions, um, across the organisation informing where we've got to, we at least see the, the opportunity in how we tell the stories of how the city has developed our history, all of our history, and including our Ghana history, of how do we build that narrative together so we tell those stories in the right way. I think we need, as part of next step in developing, we need to have further discussions to understand how they might integrate and work, work together, but I certainly see the opportunity of the focus of the program is this program was established around the build heritage. We see the opportunities to extend that around our history and heritage as a, as a collective. And, and through the chair, if I might add, our reconciliation committee has a great role to play in helping to inform us around <coughs> what that storytelling piece actually should be. Um, and so how we can actually engage with the reconciliation committee to assist us in that. Um, in that Ghana piece is really important. Thank you, Shanti. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Khan. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, I mean, the Lord Mayor got a little bit of my, my thunder regards uh, with, with how we're going to accommodate with the, with the, you know, the, the you know, Indigenous uh, component. But I look at more, I have had a few conversations and and I look at the parklands and we want to do this World Heritage List thing and I think that's something everybody really, really wants to do, but um, it's, it's like coming out uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in a formal, uh, you know, or something where you want to be pre present yourself and I'm thinking, um, what have we got in our parklands uh, so that we, you know, each of the spaces, we've named them and we've given them sort of characters that we, we create, uh, that in that, uh, with using our, our you know, Original heritage that we enhance that just like they've done now uh, down south with the with the log and, and having done things like that just small things so that we give we give unique South Australian character to it that we celebrate uh, the, the, the natural history and it's like that, that their culture is an open culture so using that that the canvas out there and uh, whether it be through a bit more orchestrated uh, showing what we're doing wetlands and having conversations around that but that we're using the parklands. 
um, to showcase uh, our space, but also between activities, you know, things where it's, it's more structured and formal, to uh, places where you can just be, or if you feel like you are, this is this is my place, this is Adelaide, this is unique, so that we are doing that. So when we do go and, and present for our World Heritage Listing, that, um, that we have something that when people do come here, we're enabled to engage them for a couple of days through the through the bit of variety, through the story, and actually uh, they can discover the great part of Adelaide that way. Um, I'm thinking too, I mean, I appreciate with all the heritage and it's important. And for me, my, my concern is not just the heritage buildings, but how we blend the constructions and things like that that are around those, because uh, we still, again, we want to be unique and uh, we have we have components that we've got already i just think if we uh, if that if it's also ensuring that that which we are building is sympathetic it, you know i mean beautiful beautiful buildings uh will complement their environment and that's really critical and uh, it is also when we're looking at it and i'll use her majesty's as a great example we're preserving the bit uh, the component that people need you know uh, feel an affection to because uh, inside you want also to have great uh, spaces that you can utilize and you know and make it a, a venue that people want to go to but you're doing it in a way that's sympathetic to you know that feel that we want to have but also to um, uh, keep up that which is the expectation that the, you know that people have with with facilities and amenities that we they need to have so that this city is the place that they come to thank you councillor Colonel. Councillors, any other questions with regards to the presentation that was just before us? Okay, yeah, there's none. Thank you very much for your time. Um, members, as I uh, indicated earlier, I'm going to deal with two items as a matter of uh, urgency, um, just to deal with any of the public um, being with us here in the room today. And I'll take you to item 7.1 first. So we'll deal with item uh, strategic alignment green, lot 14 renewal uh, SA. North Terrace Upgrade Tree Removal. Uh, members, we uh, have a recommendation before you, but before I do that, I might stand over quickly to the CEO for a quick preamble before we do the item. Clinton, please lead us, please. Thank you, Mark. Through you, Chair. Uh, this report to committee tonight is to seek support um, from the committee to recommend to council the removal of 10 regulated and one significant tree along North Terrace. Uh, the context of the removal and replacement of the trees is outlined in the, in the public report um, that's in front of you tonight. The Lot 14 development as presented uh, by Renewal SA to Council on the 3rd of September 2019 is the reason for this consideration of the trees. Um, the section in front of North Terrace, um, uh, the section of North Terrace in front of Lot 14 is the last phase of the council approved North Terrace master plan from 2001. Um, that has been um, delivered in stages since 2001, um, delivering the opportunity to establish consistent street, uh, street tree plantings along North Terrace. Uh, we continue to strive to achieve this vision of council um, and this report considers the significance of those trees, um, their health, why they um, in this case need to be replaced, um, how previous stages of North Terrace have been dealt with um, in regards to existing and new tree plantings and uh, over to other members to discuss. Thank you um, councillors. Um, as indicated by administration on this item we have a recommendation to council uh, to committee um, and for the committee to uh, then recommend to council um, you have the floor. I look for a mover and a seconder of the recommendation or a alternate uh, move otherwise. Councillor Moran. I move that we do not approve. Second seconder. Councillor Sims. So Councillor Moran, you have the floor. Uh, I think it's obvious the trees are. Do you mind turning your mic on, Councillor? The tree's been there for 100 years. Um, they are valued at $665,000. The replacement trees, and that is the Melbourne tree, monetary um, equation, which takes into carbon footprint. The 16 trees that are being replaced, are planned to replace the 11 trees, do in no way replace the carbon footprint. Um, they are healthy, 
uh, thousands of people every day manage to wander past them into the old Royal Adelaide Hospital, so they clearly can be designed to, into a, a landscape gardening section. Elm trees last for hundreds of years if properly looked after, and I'm sure these would too. They're not dangerous, as was suggested. Every, they have no more danger, danger than any other normal tree of that age. Um, so that shouldn't be taken into account. I realise that this is a quixotic uh, motion and that um, the numbers are against it, but I think you're wrong. I think you're going against public sympathy. I think it's an outstanding thing for a council to do when it's just declared a climate change emergency. And as I said before, I despair, despair at the um, irony of the things that we do in this council. For instance, we talk about heritage listing our parklands while we're considering putting a large commercial building in it, which would probably be worth any chance that it ever gets of getting world heritage listing. Um, the trees are healthy. They've been there 100 years. I don't even really know what else to say to you people, that it is clear as the nose on my face that these trees any good landscape architect worth his salt could easily design a lovely um, uh, landscape design around these trees. Mm -hmm. The trees when we did further down, when we did North Terrace, were very sickly, scrubby trees that were, were reaching the end of their life. They weren't healthy um, and the council had to get rid of them. Um, we didn't have lovely hills down there and one of the trees suggested to be removed is indeed a uh, London pine tree. Uh, if we had had rows of elms down the other part of um, North Terrace, we would have definitely retained them. We only removed very, if you go back into history, into the archives and look at what we removed, it was nothing like this. They were scrubby little trees that were planted in Victoria Square. As I said, if we'd had beautiful elm trees, healthy elm trees like this, they would have been the tree that went down North Terrace. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Councillor Sims. Thank you, Chair. Look, I, I totally endorse the comments made by Councillor Moran. You know, just three weeks ago, we declared a climate emergency on this council. To me, it is pure madness to be then talking about ripping up 100-year-old trees. Think about um, the natural shade that these trees provide at a time when we know that we're experiencing extreme heat in our city. Just last year, we had temperatures of over 47 degrees. North Terrace is a very hot part of our city and those trees provide a huge amount of natural shade. And uh, as Councillor Moran has said, they're also valued at hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I think they're priceless to the people of the city of Adelaide. And um, that really is uh, demonstrated by the huge community response that we've had to the suggestion of removing these trees. Um, I've been inundated with emails and calls from members of the community who are concerned about this and asking me what they can do to save the trees. I know there's a petition on change.org that has been signed by last time I looked more than 1300 people. And there's also a big contingent here in the gallery today. And uh, I really want to thank the members of the community for coming along, for making their voice heard and for speaking up for these trees, because of course they don't have a voice. Um, and uh, I really appreciate the community coming up and, and standing up for natural life in our city. Um, you know, I think when we are making these kind of decisions, we need to think about what are the alternatives. And in this case, I don't accept the suggestion that there is no alternative. I don't accept the suggestion from Renewal SA that this is the only option. With all of the technology around and all of the opportunities available in landscaping, um, do we really accept the idea that we have no option but to knock down 100-year-old trees? I mean, I think that would be an act of environmental vandalism. And uh, I really urge members of this council not to sign the death warrant for these trees tonight. Let's go back to Renewal SA and say, come on guys, you're not gonna get away with this. We want you to work around the trees. They were here before um, and we need to accommodate them in any plan for that part of our city. The problem with these kind of beautiful old trees is once they're lost, we can't get them back. Mm -hmm. and you know, Renewal SA and others can talk about planting new trees, but it's going to take a really long time before they get to the level of maturation of these trees. Um, and um, they're a part of our city's history. They're part of the social fabric of 
our uh, city. We talk a lot about trying to link the parklands into the city and these trees actually form a natural link, a natural uh, green runway into the parklands um, and Botanic Park nearby. So please, I urge members of council not to go down this path. Don't remove these trees. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillors, anyone else would like to speak? Uh, Councillor Knopf. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I suppose uh, the first thing I have to say, I mean, this decision that we're looking at is not an easy one because we have to take in all the facts and uh, it's not comfortable. It's easy to do nothing. Standard, no problem, because it isn't always about what is. I mean, yes, these trees are great and they're beautiful and they've been there 100 years, but they're also planted 100 years ago. And if we listen to last, uh, you know, the last presentation, how the, the next generation of trees and that will be done um, so that they will be, uh, you know, last a long time, their lifespan will be better, their condition will be held longer. And it is really critical to think about those sort of things when you do that. And I mean, this is now part of, uh, we also have to look at the future plan. The entire rest of North, uh, North Terrace didn't have an issue when we were going through there and, and redoing that. And this is a one continuous promenade. It isn't just a hodgepodge of, of uh, small uh, sections. This is where continuous uh, move where the trees that are, be, uh, that are there now will mature together and will create that link between uh, you know, the government house through to the botanical gardens. Now, this is only a further uh, you know, extension of that along the plans that the council had previously endorsed. And I mean, these things don't take a week. I mean, this has been a long time coming and it's been a continuous movement across to, uh, to that. And I mean, there is a declining health and that was held up a couple of times. And yes, there are a couple of different components to that. Yes, some say seven years and some say 20 years. The issue here is that they are declining and their value is also declining. And uh, what, which, for which generation are we doing these trees? Because leaving them there is about our generation perhaps, but for that, as we talk about climate change, I mean, these trees will die, they will get weaker, and they will be removed one at a time or two at a time or whatever, and they will be replaced hot, you know, in, a, in an ad hoc manner. And that's not a, 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 a solution either. And the thing is that for my children, my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, those trees are important to them. And all we're going to do is leave them a legacy, which will be for, you know, uh, when they have to be removed in time because they're becoming frail land, they do need to be managed. There's, there's no, it's not as though there's an ex no expense here. There's an increasing expense to look after these trees to survive. Then uh, we give that uh, cost and all that to the next generation, not forgetting that we are, if we talk about uh, climate change, we talk about what we're doing, we just passed motions to increase 20% of the trees in the South Park lands, et cetera, or uh, in, uh, the coverage. We're doing that. So we are we are trying to future proof it. It all takes time. Sadly, we are 30, 40 years behind in that regard, but I can't help that. But we can only do what we do now. Um, we are replacing it with over 40 trees. So, and these are mature trees, and yes, it's, uh, and they will in time, uh, you know, give you the cover, etc. and they'll give it to you for the next 120 to 150 years. Why? Because we know a lot better now what we're doing with the trees is what we did before. And we're talking about the remainder of, uh, with the, uh, the, the improvements that we're looking at. I mean, these trees, the way they're growing, we cannot do the improvements other than just some relatively repair work, simply because uh, the way the root systems and that are, they're, they're going to damage whatever, and that means we'll have ongoing maintenance anyway, and it isn't going to be any extra benefit. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Would you like more time? For just a moment. Please. Okay. Can I just get a show of hands there for time? Oh. Thank you very much. We have a majority there. Thank you. So, and if we look at it, Councillor I mean, Moran, please allow Councillor Knoll to finish his debate. Surely you can't possibly mean that. Councillor Moran, me? please like allow Councillor Knoll to finish the debate. So, you know, and if, we, if we look at this now, I mean, it is a, a, a framing of a new uh, future for this, and it is, I mean. And I, I can appreciate the sentiment and that there's a lot of a lot of passion with that and it's associated with what the space used to be and that space has now moved and it's now in another place and we should we need to uh, take that and you know uh, use that space and there's you know as it is but this is a new beginning for a new place and we are uh, the project is returning a lot of space back to parklands back to the community and i think that's really critical to remember as well that this is part of a larger plan and not just uh, this one space yeah. And, uh, you know, I think we've got a couple. 
I mean, all I can say is that I, it is a hard decision to make and <coughs> we've got to do it sometime. And I'd rather we do it and we do it in a uniform way because that way these trees will mature together and they'll make a, you know, a site uh, together. Otherwise, you're just going to have a whole variety of you know, different forms and shapes and it won't give you that impressive uh, promenade that we're sort of wishing for. Thank you, Councillor Carl. Uh, Lord Mayor, followed by Councillor Dillon, and then Councillor uh, Abrenta. Thank you. Um, I, I agree that this is a really hard decision and nothing, no one is going to take this decision lightly. Um, I did go back and actually had a look, not only at, uh, so I wanted to have a look at the plan, the original plan, which was 2001, which is by the same designer that has actually completed this section of plan, which is Joan Hunter from Origin, at uh, Oxygen. Um, I also had a look at North Terrace, the photos before we did the North Terrace up and when we completed the North Terrace and then what it looks like now. And um, they weren't scrubby little things. In fact, we removed um, in the first instance in 2005, 31 non-significant trees and three significant trees. So they were of great standing. They were, you know, more than that three metres in diet. It isn't correct. I've actually got it in front of me. Councillor Moran. I was on council. Councillor um, Moran, do not interrupt any of the other councillors while they're speaking. You're entitled to ask a question of administration of clarification when they're finished. If you would like to ask a question, I'll allow that. to listen to somebody Councillor Moran, no one's interrupted you. Please, I'm asking you for the last time. Do not interrupt other councillors while they're debating, especially the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, please continue. Um, thank you, Chair. I also, I did actually look up the reports um, and also look at uh, uh, when it went through APLA, um, and I believe it was actually moved by you, Councillor Moran, when it went through APLA in 2005 for the removal of those trees, the 31 non-significant and three significant trees. Again, in 2009, we removed 33 uh, non-significant and one significant tree, and that was to complete the landscape. And we have now got a beautiful, it is our premier boulevard, um, and it was a vision that had started in 2001, and fair, fair enough, it's taken a very long time. Um, we actually have gone back several times to explore whether it would be possible for them to design and complete that work around those, those trees. And uh, we have been informed by various experts that that can't be done because of the way that they actually have delayed that paving. That it would actually kill off the, the root systems of those trees if they were going to do it. Um, there are safety concerns. I've read both Arbor's reports. Um, one said five to 10, one said 10 to 20. Um, the reality is that within a period of a decade, we're going to have to replace those trees and we won't have done up the last section of the boulevard. Um, and I think uh, the presentation last week uh, by uh, Oxygen and um, Renew SA gave us that information, as well as the uh, continuous work that's having to be done around safety concerns of those trees. Um, it is always a difficult thing, but we do have to have one eye on the future. And one of the things that we wanted to do within, you know, at least two decades is complete North Terrace Boulevard. And I think, unfortunately, this is the only way that we can. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Donovan. Thank you. Um, I'm supporting the amendment to not approve uh, the removal of the trees because I think this gives us, uh, it gives us a moment to pause and actually consider that this master plan was done almost 20 years ago and actually has not factored in our transport needs. And we should be pausing to consider the fact that the uh, transport of cyclists has not been adequate along North Terrace. It is a key boulevard for active transport and pausing to consider how we can better connect up North Terrace, which connects directly into the museum, into the universities, um, and see how we can connect it into the Frome bikeway. With those trees in place, they provide a, a potential buffer um, and it is a, a possibility and it has, wasn't considered in the initial master plan and I would welcome the opportunity to pause and reconsider how we could do that. Thank you, Councillor Dolan. Councillor, no, oh, sorry, Councillor Renzo. Thank you, Chair. Um, can I ask a question of administration? Um, what is the value of the public realm upgrade um, in that vicinity that Renewal is are proposing? Approximately. Uh, is that something that we can discuss? Through the chair, um, 
that information is probably best asked of Renew SA because <clears throat> they have committed to funding that section of the uh, upgrade of North Terrace. Okay. Um, if, if I can, I'll, I'll, I'll assume in a few millions of, of dollars, that's probably how much um, it is going to cost. Um, there's probably a number of ways to, to look at it. From, from our residents and ratepayers' perspective, we'll be saving them uh, quite a few millions of dollars uh, up front if, uh, if the state government wants to pitch in and uh, uh, um, I guess, you know, fix up that, uh, that public, um, public realm um, area there on North Terrace. But um, the, the, other, the other perspective, and uh, I would like to remind some of, the, some of the members about this, is that I was having uh, um, a, a number of conversations with our East End traders. Now these guys are the ones who have been hit very hard by what's happened with the, uh, with the hospital moving. And what they're looking forward to is the lot 14 uh, redevelopment finishing. And uh, they want to get that crowd of four, five, six thousand visitors a day uh, back into that uh, vicinity. Uh, this, is, this is something that uh, has been highlighted to me uh, on a number of occasions, and this is something that I'd like to uh, remind members of. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, the uh, landscape architect um, here who uh, was actually the, uh, the original landscape architect who started the, the uh, North Terrace uh, upgrades back in the 90s. So uh, at least um, it's, uh, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's reassuring that we've got the same landscape architect, which means that we're going to have a consistent approach. And it's something that uh, we can see from West Terrace right through to, uh, to East Terrace. So that for me is uh, it's reassuring. But, but also if we're looking at uh, the, uh, um, I guess, you know, the climate change perspective, if we're getting more trees than what we already have, I personally think that that's, uh, that's a good thing. And um, as uh, the Lord Mayor and Councillor Canal have uh, mentioned, all options have been explored. And this, unfortunately, is the only option that we do have. And hopefully, uh, this is something that, uh, that we can plant today so that uh, future generations, um, you know, 100 years or so later on down the track, people can look at it and, uh, and, and think about the, the work that we've done here right today in this day and age, just like the people 100 years ago did the same sort of thing uh, uh, for us to enjoy in this day and age. Councillors, um, uh, sorry, Councillor Martin, followed by Councillor Kerry and Councillor... I'm happy with Councillor Kerry here first. No, please go ahead, Councillor. I saw you. I uh, called it, Councillor. Councillor Martin, I saw your hand first. Let's stick to proceed. Okay, look, I'm, I'm happy to speak. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Look, I... I have not sat through such a load of claptrap in at least a week. <laughs> at least a week since I've heard these misleading statements, these half-truths. The fact of the matter is, the matter came to committee almost a month ago. It came with a report from our own arborist, from our own staff, which said the trees are perfectly healthy. It said the trees are providing more uh, oxygen to that part of the city than any new tree would. It says that the hollow trees are providing shelter for habitat. It says that these trees have decades, if not another century in them. This is what we received from our own staff, from our own arborist. And it dismayed the Lord Mayor and Team Adelaide so much that they voted for another report. And guess what? That report said exactly what they wanted it to say. It said the trees had to go. So this is a contrived result. It's designed to facilitate the state government and its uh, organization charged with redeveloping that part of the um, North Terrace Boulevard. Now look, I, uh, I can't believe that we're actually sitting here contemplating as tree vandals, as tree vandals chopping down these trees. We ought to, as a council that claims to be interested in climate change, be preserving these. Now, these, these uh, uh, words about plans approved, council having considered this, this or, none of those things have been to council. They were just documents and drawings that had been produced in order to back up this argument about cutting down trees. I, I am absolutely appalled. I think it is for everyone in this audience, everyone in this room to see exactly what happens when you have a majority faction in a council lined up, all repeating what each other is saying. Sensationalism, 
half-truths, misleading statements, all designed to get the result that the Lord Mayor wants. Now, just, just watch it. Watch it when we go to the boat. They'll all line up with their hands in the air. And I, I say to you guys, I say to you guys, well, uh, it's true. The chair, one of your colleagues, one of your Team Adelaide colleagues is shouting shame at me. The shame rests with her and everyone else who is going to vote to chop those trees down. Shame on you. Shame on you. Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Kira. Just a question, uh, if I may. Sure, please go ahead. Um, just on the uh, risk to safety of the trees, um, the report that we have uh, states that uh, nine trees have a low to moderate risk um, and one tree has a moderate risk. Uh, the tree in Melbourne, which recently tipped over and killed, uh, sadly, a and killed, sadly, a uh, passerby uh, was, I believe, the same species. Is that correct? Through you, Chair, I believe it was the same species, yes. Are you, are you aware of any risk analysis of that tree, uh, of those trees? Did uh, the City of Melbourne have any um, appraisal of that tree's uh, risk profile prior to that incident? Uh, through the Chair, uh, not that I've seen, no. Point, point of order, point of order. There is a report which is available to the So that's not a point of order, Councillor. No, it is no, point it's of not order. a point of order. That's a point of clarification. I might allow so that after he finishes response, his debate. A, response. a point of order is with regards to meeting procedures. This has nothing to do with meeting procedures. Uh, I beg your pardon. We have a report. Councillor Martin, Councillor Kerr is in mid-debate. Let him finish. I will then allow you to ask a question after. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerr, please go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, I'll stop with the questions just there. Um, I'd like to say that uh, I I'm, I I'm a bit troubled by the rush to portray this as a party political exercise, uh, that this is somehow a factional exercise. Um, I would have loved to have seen an, uh, a similar level of passion expressed when the date palm trees uh, were discussed to be removed and, and there may be grins from <laughs> Councillor Sims on this on this point, which is which is unusual, uh, gi given the given the given the principle, uh, gi given the principle, there was not the equal uh, there was not an equal attempt, I would say, to the chamber to enlist public support uh, from councillors as there was uh, as there is in this case. And any and if I may finish, Councillor Moran, any suggestion any suggestion that I'm acting uh, in a party political or factional way on this, uh, given my record on advocacy for the retention of the date palm trees, oh. uh, which, are current, which are currently slated to be to be removed, uh, I think uh, is well probably a joke. I ought to take uh, insult and I ought to take umbrage to that, but I can't be bothered, uh, Chair. Um, but I'll just point it out for the benefit of the Chamber. So I remain troubled at the attempts to turn this into a, into a political issue, into a factional dispute. I don't approach this in any kind of political way whatsoever. Uh, I can state that for a fact. I am presented as a new councillor with reports. I'm presented uh, with uh, a, 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 a large scale plan for the change for a change in North Terrace. And, and part of that plan includes the removal of trees. I am told from uh, I'm told in the Councillor report, Sims and Councillor Moran. I am told in the reports, I am told in the reports that the uh, estimated lifespan of the tree is 10 to 20 years. Uh, I am told that there are uh, approximately 29 to, to 39 trees, uh, way, way more than double. The number of trees being presented uh, uh, for replacement. Uh, I am further aware that uh, there are, there, in response to the climate change uh, uh, questions, uh, there is a recent report, there is a recent study that has shown that young trees are better at absorbing carbon dioxide than established trees. Uh, so there's a report, there is a, a recent study, I urge members in, in the chamber to have come to uh, come to see this uh, uh, meeting, who are passionate about this topic, to, to, to look this up. There is a report from the University of Birmingham that cites studies that show that trees less than 140 years old are responsible for removing more than half the atmosphere's carbon dioxide. In fact, they're far more efficient uh, carbon sinks than established trees. Um, I'm told that the current trees uh, will not survive the renovation, the, the redevelopment of that area. I have to make a decision based on all of the facts before me. 
I'm going to do that this evening, but I want to place it on the record that I am not making that decision in any kind of factional party political way. And I think to suggest that uh, and, to, and to do that in such a, an adversarial way utterly demeans this chamber. And I, and I, thoroughly, thoroughly, res I thoroughly resent that uh, from other councillors. Thank you, Councillor Kiros. Councillor Kiros. Thank you, Chair. I have to say that I'm very disappointed tonight with the actions of some of the senior councillors uh, tonight. I would have expected to be able to uh, look at them and then lead us in, in a proper direction in regards to our decision making. Yeah. But they're leading us in a way that we are being bullied to um, side with them on a on their decision. But we're actually making a decision based on the reports that are put before us. We are not making a decision in the collaborative faction or a team Adelaide or whatever way he wants to put it. And I want to make that clear. It's very disappointing also to see him attack the Lord Mayor in that way and you see a councillor call other councillors. Councillor Kuros, shut up. Sorry, councillor I just want to make that point. talk to your motion, talk to it the recommendation. Here, councillor it, it, Kuros, I'm speaking. Sure. Talk to the recommendation, yes. not to the response of other councillors. Sorry, I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. No worries, Chair. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that, um, as exactly what Councillor Kira said, is said that it will damage, the reports have said that it will make a damage and impact the root zones if we try and pave over these, where these trees are at the moment. I think that that would actually lessen the life of the trees, as we said. Um, as the trees remain at the moment, we were advised that they we were advised that they would last maybe 20 years if they're managed responsibly. So if we leave the trees where we are and we pave over them, we damage the root system, we're actually reducing their lifespan as what we've been told. If you look at it overall, we're looking at replacing the current trees with 29 new semi-mature trees and 12 new 6.5 metre tall trees. In 2005, like the Lord Mayor said, and it stated in the report, there were removal of 34 trees, which included three significant trees. 34 trees were replaced in, uh, with 48 trees in 2005. So you cannot tell me out of those 34 trees that they were all withering and they're all about to die and blah, blah, blah. They cannot tell me that. They would have to have been in a healthy state. So that council at that time decided to remove those trees in 2005 to make way for the development that we have proposed for what's going to happen out in Lot 14, same way that we're going to uh, do in Lot 14. I have to say it has been a very difficult decision um, to make on this and um, it's, it's actually, they actually have more sentimental value to me than anything else, but we have to move forward and we have to stick to the vision to what we have for North, North, North Terrace. And we also have to be realistic with our approach here. They will not survive for the full 20 years if we start paving over these trees. The root systems will damage, it is being told to us. And in, in Councillor Donovan's point, I think they would advise to us that it'd be very difficult to put a bikeway there. Um, and even if they remove the trees, I think uh, uh, the way that they've planned it, it's that they, it's a communal, it's a communal um, uh, use, um, which is used Girls, quite effectively right now. Time's up. Would you like more time? No, thank you. Thank you, councillors. Um, most have spoken. I'm going to refer back to the CEO to clarify a few of the comments that were made today with regards to other risk reports, etc. so we can get some of the facts tabled. Councillor Martin, I'll see you. Thank you. Through the chair, I just think it's useful to, to provide some facts regarding the useful life expectancy of the trees, because I think there's some confusion on that. So I'll just ask Clinton to clarify that. Thanks, Mark. Um, through the chair, just in terms of the useful life expectancy that's been um, reported on in the tree assessment report um, undertaken by council by our own arborist, um, we're looking at the majority of those trees having a useful life expectancy of 20 years, with one of the trees Yay! having Thank you. one of the trees having a useful life expectancy of 10 years, um, according to our arborist. So that's just to clarify for members of the public and councillors. Councillor Martin, you had a question? Uh, yes, um, uh, two, two questions. In relation to the useful life expectancy of the trees, is it true or is it not true that the council's arborist uh, says in pages 12 to 19 of his report that the useful life of the trees is not 20 years, but 20 
plus years. That is to say, there is a plus after the 20 against most of those trees. So we've heard the advice from the administration today. You want to know if there's a plus at the end of the advice that was just given? Correct. There is. Through you, Chair, just looking at that report, Councillor, on page 12, uh, the useful life expectancy is 20 years with no plus. Um, 13. Moving to page 13, it does say 20 plus years. Yes. 14, 15, 16. I mean, there's only one exception there that has 10 years. Is that correct? 15 says 10 years, that's correct. Correct. And I note that the administration said uh, that there had been no um, safety analysis. Is it not correct that the city's arborist says on page 10 of his report, the following components have been appraised in order to establish the risk posed by these trees to people or property. Probability of failure, the likelihood of a large branch falling under normal weather conditions is one in 10,000 to one in 100,000. These trees are inspected annually for visible defects, which lowers the probability of failure and remedial restor restorative pruning has also lowered any likelihood of failure. The overall risk of Councilor harm Martin. that these... No, I no, have no, a question. No, no, no. no that's I not have a question. question. No, you said, isn't it true? No. You're reading a paragraph. I can I... have anyone read that paragraph. Your question's clear. My question is, yes. is in the light of the arborist's report, is it the administration's view that the arborist is wrong to suggest, as he does, that the risk is one in 100,000 within the tolerable zone? Is the administration disputing the arborist's report? Question to the administration. Could you please repeat the question, Councillor? Certainly. The Arborist report says the following components have been appraised in order to establish the risk posed by these trees to people and property. Probability of failure. The likelihood of a large branch falling under normal weather conditions is 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000. These trees are inspected annually for visible defects, which lowers the probability of failure, and remedial restorative pruning has also lowered the likelihood of failure. The overall risk of harm that these trees pose after consideration of the above components is one in 100,000, that is within the tolerable region. Does the administration dispute its arborists report? Uh, in answer to that question, no. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. No we've got Councillor Sims, we've had a fair bit of, you've already spoken. Just a question. It's quick. So we're very, very clear. So the trees we're talking about have a life expectancy of 20 plus years, not 20 So years. Councillor Sims, uh, you've heard the answer today from administration. There's a reference on one page which says 20. There's a reference on other page that says 20 plus. Well, other and there's another reference that talks about 10 years. So it's well, been clear. So okay. 20 plus. Councillors, anyone else would like to add to the debate? Be it that there's none, I believe Councillor Moran was summing up, but before she does, I'm just going to make a quick remark with regards to, um, to this specific recommendation. Um, on the 17th of August 2015, and this is a really important thing to note because I think if we go back to the future, um, the Council of the past has made a very difficult decision, probably similar to one that may happen today or next week at Council, with regards to the future of the North Adelaide Boulevard as we know it today. Uh, I think to every visitor that's come to the City of Adelaide uh, and to every photo and every image we've seen across TV screens and social media, we have seen the wonderful North, uh, North uh, Terrace Boulevard with the cultural precincts and how that interconnects to our city specifically. We've had an opportunity, not for a very long time, with the Royal Adelaide Hospital moving to the western side of the city to really look at a whole remake of Lot 14. Uh, the state government has taken an active step to do that. There's a significant amount of return to parklands as a result uh, of that, or beautification and greening. And part of the, the thing, and I think this is where it all started for me, is my initial response to this was no. And the reason I said no was the very reason to what some of the other councillors were saying, and similar to the Lord Mayor and others here today, was there's got to be another way. Uh, we have had people in this room come and present to us. We have looked at ways on how we could make this work, and there isn't a way to make this work. 
The challenge that sits before us as a council today with regards to the specific upgrade is there's an opportunity there with the state government to be able to improve that public realm, to continue on the legacy of the previous council. One that councillor, uh, probably the only councillor that's been in the previous council was councillor Moran was part of in 2005 and 2009 to deliver on a great outcome for the North Terrace Boulevard. Uh, I don't think this is an easy decision. Uh, it's probably one of the tougher decisions that this council will need to make. Uh, but I will be speaking against the current recommendation today on the basis that intergenerationally, the future would look at this as a good outcome for our city, uh, not just for the precinct, but also for the city as a whole. And I'd ask members to not support the recommendation put by Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, I'll hand over to you to sum up. Thank you. Uh, yes, look, I've got a long way to go to sum up. Um, I think the suggestion the Deputy Lord Mayor said that this, uh, that if we don't remove this avenue of beautiful elms, it won't look as wonderful as the rest of uh, North Terrace is incredibly wrong. That's like saying we'd take the elm um, carriageway through the park lands and replace it with something prettier. Um, and in a hundred years, people will really like it. Somebody said in the debate um, that, uh, I think it was France saying people in a hundred years will really appreciate us chopping those trees down and planting new trees. I think perhaps people that lived a hundred years ago would be appalled that just when these trees are reaching their their majesty that this stupid city is chopping them down. And it is a silly thing to do. It's going back to the old Australian way, if it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't, chop it down. It is a dumb decision. As for the date palm uh, that Council Care put up, and as I said, I'm just going through to answer the things that were mentioned, I passionately supported that. And we actually got a good outcome that the tree would be repositioned. Um, I felt just as strongly about that and I'm appalled that he doesn't carry on his love of uh, beautiful um, non-Indigenous trees to save this wonderful elm uh, avenue. Um, if we were, it would, I was glad that it was cleared up that they're not dangerous, one in 100,000. Honestly, the lemon centres down Montefiore Hill pose a far greater risk and we wouldn't dare touch those. The trees have 20 plus years. In arborist language, that means uh, out of the foreseeable future. They don't say 50, 100 years, they say 20 plus. So these trees have a good and uh, noble lifespan ahead of them. I was on the council. And I think I'd be the only person in this room that made the decisions. They were not majestic trees. They were similar to the trees we had on Victoria Park Square, I mean, and nobody had any problem removing them. They were sticky, horrible trees. These are lovely elm trees. To talk about planting more trees, I think Councillor Carer said, the Melbourne um, uh, equation for working out the uh, value of a tree is done on its carbon footprint. Now, if you can tell me that the um, the cost, the uh, monetary value of the trees we're replacing is anywhere near six hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars, shut up. It's not. It's about fifty-eight thousand uh, dollars. James Hader is a wonderful um, landscape gardener. I don't think he was the original one, but uh, he certainly has been around for a long time. And I'm sure if he'd been given a different brief, then that, that would be a different answer. Hassan has put his um, finger on the problem. Of course, there's not one outcome. These are 11 trees. It's not flying a man to the moon. Um, as I said, it's ridiculous to say there's only one option. The um, government will be doing up that streetscape, whatever we do. The East End traders will not be advantaged by removing these beautiful trees. Councillor Moran, you're signing up. Can I have one more minute to yes. sum up? Show of uh, hands, please, councillors, just show of hands. Thank there's you. absolutely no disadvantage to the East End traders. They will not get more business because we chop 11 trees down. Probably they might get less. Mm -hmm. um, nothing I've heard and read um, uh, changes my mind and nothing that you've heard and read should change your mind. Uh, to suggest that we are suggesting this is a political decision, what we're saying is it's a factual decision and I think the gallery is smart enough to know that, um, mm -hmm. that when this is made, we're not suggesting it's the Liberal or Labor Party or anything like that, but there is a strong faction, they stick together and their vote will be stuck together and the Lord Mayor's in that faction. Um, Councillor Moran, uh, to say the Lord that, Mayor doesn't have an opportunity no, to respond sorry, that to you. Has been Councillor Moran, the Lord been... Mayor does not have an opportunity to respond to you respectfully, please. 
the to point. suggest that one at a time replacement is somehow an anathema. That's how normal street trees are replaced one at a time. So there's not just a chainsaw massive getting rid of everything. Um, so to run through again, these are valuable, healthy trees who pose no threat um, and could easily be landscaped around um, by a good landscape architect who we have. They have 20 plus years, a uh, vast majority of them. They're beautiful. The public want them. Um, there's nobody that wants them to down. Thank you, Councillor Moran. With that summing up, I'll put the recommendation to vote for Councillor Moran uh, as we can see on the screen. All those in favour? All those against? That has failed. That has failed. If I could please ask members of the public to be respectful, please. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, that now recommendation has failed. If I could ask someone to move the original recommendation or an alternate, moved by Councillor Abraham Zeta, seconded yeah, by Councillor Ho. Uh, Councillor Abraham Zeta, would you like to speak about that? Councillor Ho, would you like to speak? Reserve your right. Any other councillor would like to speak? Councillor Abraham Zeta to sum up. I'll put that back to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Thank you very much. Right. Members, that concludes item 7.1, uh, dealing with the tree removals on North Let's Terrace. Let's take ourselves to the thing home now. History will remember you for destroying our South Australian history. If you could I am going please be respectful of I the am committee. Respectful. I'm, I'm asking you please to be respectful of the stuff that belongs to us. Can you please be respectful? These are that our is, trees, not yours. This our. is Council's this committee. Is Council committee decision. Please be respectful of the committee's decision. The committee is wrong. I'm a horticulturalist. I went and hunt these trees only half an hour ago. You're wrong. Leave them alone. Spit on you. Thank you very much. We move on to the next item dealing with item um, 6.2 North Adelaide parking review update. Thank you very much, and I will hand over to the CEO for a quick preamble. Okay, thanks, Chair. Council members will be familiar with the North Adelaide Parking Review and Council decision, um, where we resolved to relax the residential parking permit criteria, where we created a 12 month trial residential parking permit, where we installed time limiting parking controls in the 10, parking, 10 hour parking bays and approximately half unrestricted parking bays with a view to reducing city commuter parking. So that was where council resolved recently. Implementation of that decision commenced in on the 1st of July. However, given the amount of angst among, with, the, with some of the changes, uh, it's become apparent that these changes have, have created some unintended consequences uh, for local commuters and people living in North Adelaide, including nurses and teachers. Um, with the aim of being responsive to the concerns, we've brought the three-month review forward by two months. And the purpose of this workshop tonight is to um, gain members' views uh, with regard to possible solutions to address some of the angst that's evident at the moment. Um, the administrative team have proposed a couple of recommendations designed to address the feedback that has been received. <coughs> You'll also be aware of the specific motion from Councillor Moran and that is that council investigate the parent parking situations around the Women's and Children's Hospital and possible solutions, including overstay permits by consulting the hospital and assessing the situation. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, Phil Robinson, the Executive Director of <coughs> Corporate Services from the Women's and Children's Hospital, who's happy to respond to any questions members would like to address to him tonight. So I'll just, at the moment, I hand over to Vanessa and Elisa to lead us through. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Mark, and through you, Chair. Um, my plan tonight was really just to take the paper as read. I am, we tried to faithfully represent all of the feedback that we received to date on the um, North Adelaide Parking Review. Um, and I think Mark covered off the, the key messages that I was going to talk through. Uh, so really, we just wanted to pose um, two questions to members, which are um, what are members' views on the reversal of some of the parking control changes back to unrestricted parking? Um, I guess 
and the purpose of that question, obviously the premise behind changing the um, unrestricted parking to timed parking was to address um, a CBD commuter parking problem. Um, the feedback would suggest that, um, that the impact has been primarily to North Adelaide commuters, so people driving into North Adelaide um, to work, particularly around those parkland areas, so the hospitals and the schools. Um, so our first question is, um, what are your views on reversing some of those changes back? And the second question is, what are your views on expanding the trial permit criteria on the basis that um, the trial permits are uh, relatively undersubscribed under and so um, there's the opportunity to expand those further if members are still keen to pursue trial So permits. first is first, thank you, uh, Vanessa. Are members happy to take this as read uh, or would you like a synopsis of any no, everyone's happy to take this as read. Okay, so that's the first question there for you. Councillor Moran, you had your hand up with regards. Are you looking at answering the question? Yes, I am. I think Please it's go easy, ahead. easy to answer. Um, right from the beginning of this, and there have been some um, misunderstandings from new councillors about how this came about. Uh, Councillor Martin and I supported it, moved um, that we start a trial. We weren't specific about anything in the trial, but the, as um, the Deputy Lord Mayor said, it was to get rid of all day parkers, which were becoming a nuisance in North Adelaide. The administration then went away um, and spoke to, and set up the trial. Um, at the second to last, the last meeting of the last council, before we went into caretaker mode, um, Councillor Martin, and I totally agree with him, uh, sought to... Councillor Moran, I'm not looking at a debate. If you can please answer the question. I've given the history of it, though. We don't need to do that. We're, we're, we're past that stage. We're now at a point no, no, where... No, so this is really important. I can see the way that um, this is going to go. No, Councillor, please allow me to chair the meeting. If you don't mind, well, I'll assure you it's not going to go any specific the way. It is. Um, it's either going to throw the whole thing out or it's going to open up um, extra areas to, to Dominic's and flood our parkland streets. What we wanted was to have no, no unlimited areas because all you did was put um, parking where it hadn't been before in a smaller area, which upset people and I don't blame them. What we wanted and still want is all limited parking and to and relaxation of the residential parking stickers so there are no losers and we also wanted nurses there we wanted to cope with the incoming workers with an override system the unlimited parking doesn't work st dominic's for some reasons let every girl that's got a park, driver's license park there are hundreds they talk about teachers it is not it is students I live behind St Dominic's Priory, so I am an expert there. They, of course, have had their parking limited and they don't like it. But just to open Mills Terrace again, and I'm only using my street because it's the one I'm most familiar with, uh, is a disaster. We are just choked with cars all the time. So to the answer to those two questions, Thank you, no, do not create more unrestricted. And we've said this to our parking uh, women over again. No, the, the unrestricted is a damn nuisance um, and it just fills out the outer parkland streets. Give St Dominic's uh, and the nurses and the people that are not happy with this override permits and there to so the key question the next one yes expand the trial permit but do not put the um, parking solution by just having unrestricted areas increasing because then you'll get your all day parkers back again who come pretty early and nobody wins. So Councillor Moran, so, so at one stage the administration please listen. So to be clear, um, your answer with regards to the first question, what are members of you on the reversal of some of the parking control changes back to unrestricted is no. A strong no. Uh, in areas adjacent to parklands, so what you're suggesting with regards to that is to extend a default style permit that overrides the unrestricted for those areas. And what are members' views on the expansion of the trial permit criteria? That is yes. A strong yes. Okay, thank you. So we've heard from Councillor Moran. Councillor Martin, would you like to comment on this? I know you're a big advocate. I'm happy to. Listen for now. Others. Other councillors would like to ask? Councillor Kuros. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I took it upon myself to actually uh, take out a survey in regards, as well as you having the your say, so thank you. Sorry if I, you felt that I might have overrided that, but I just wanted to see myself to um, actually what it is. Councillor Kiros, people you need to answer those questions. North Adelaide, well, I'm getting there. Sure. Um, so in this survey, uh, 250 people uh, filled out the survey, but I narrowed it down uh, to 155 in total because they actually gave me their details. So out of the, pe the people that um, have filled out, 85 of them were commuters that actually work in North Adelaide. And they were actually a range of people. They were people that work in Melbourne Street, um, they were people that work in the services industries, teachers, nurses, as we've heard. So there are a full range of people, uh, you know, small businesses that work in North Adelaide. So there's a full cross range of people that actually have been really inconvenienced to coming into North Adelaide and parking and coming into work. So I'm, I'm taking into account that we actually need these people coming into North Adelaide, not only to work, but also they bring business into the community. They, sh they will shop there on the lunch break. They will probably Councilor go Kuros, to the market. I need so, you to get to the sorry. question. This is not a debate. So three, three. Uh, well, I just want to get my results out. So three, uh, so 66. Um, Councillor Kuros, we'll have the opportunity to the residents. Council, I need you to answer the questions of this committee. I'm getting there. Please. So I've had a response. So 66 residents say they don't support that. So 66 of the people that are residents that don't support it. So if we were to reverse back this trial, if we were to take it away, do you think that that would um, be supportive? to the North Adelaide community by, by the commuters and the residents by the response that you have received. <coughs> um, through the chair, could you just repeat the question? Right. Sorry, Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get well, I'm, I'm trying to get to the point that I, I feel that there's a lot of angst in regards to this parking trial. So what the response that I'm getting and the response out there from the community. So Councillor Kuros, I'm going to so intervene. We Councillor Kuros, just for a second. Councillor Kuros, I'm going to stop this for a second. We are running a workshop here. You need to be able to make a decision and answer the two questions that are currently on the board. I don't want the administration to interfere in the political debate at this stage. They're looking for feedback based on information they've collected. The information you've collected should inform your decision not that of the administration or any of the elected members. So Sorry. can you please focus on answering the two questions clearly so I can move to other councillors? Well, I'm feeling that this, this trial has affected the commuters that are coming into North Adelaide to work and overall, um, and I'm feeling that the residents are not supporting of it. I'm getting a response from residents that it uh, hasn't solved their problem in regards to them parking in North Adelaide. So your answer is Yes, you are happy with reversal of some of the parking control changes. Yes, I am. And what's your answer with regards to what our members' views with the expansion of the trial permit criteria? Well, I think that we should continue with the permit criteria if we're going to continue on the basis of what the trial is at the so moment. However, what? if we're going to relax some of the unrestricted parking, then we need to review the expansion of the trial permit. So is that clear as a response for our administration from Councillor Kiros? Yes. Thank you. So I'll go on to the Lord. Sorry, we'll make Jodie Ander. Please go ahead. Um, I, I, I'm not, it's not the forum to do it, so I'll have to talk to Councillor Moran offline because I actually would like to understand how a, a permit system would work in terms of how it would be administered to nurses and schools and everything else because that's a whole other layer of administration. I'm not sure how that would work. I understand in terms of the reversal of the parking controls um, from unrestricted uh, may not be the answer, but I'm not, that's sort of, that's between those two questions, if that makes sense. Sure. So, um, so I wouldn't have to wait until this comes back to actually be able to answer that because they're all, one determines the other. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, it, to, to directly answer the questions, um, should the uh, parking control changes be reversed? Um, no, I think though we do need to tweak some of the um, criteria um, to take in some of the high need groups that we're talking about, and you know, nurses, 
and potentially people at the local school and, and so on, um, people who I regard being key, key kind of equity groups. Um, so yes, I think we should be making a special consideration for their needs. For me though, there is a broader um, question, not just about North Adelaide, but about the city more broadly around if we're dealing with the issue of parking, what we can do to reduce reliance on cars and what role we can play in doing that. And because we're talking a lot about finding different measures uh, around addressing the parking issue. Um, I recognise, of course, it is an issue and something we need to deal with. But I, I'd also really like to see us putting our energies into reducing reliance on cars. And if there's, you know, in, incentives... Maybe that you want to bring that in as a separate motion? Well, I just, I do think it's relevant because if we're talking about a, a trial, yep. looking at these issues. So I just want to flag with administration, I'd love us to start talking about what we can do to encourage alternatives to car transport as well. Maybe it's something you might want to take offline and bring as a motion to change as well. I may well do. To be continued. Thank you. Um, councillors, any other... I need those questions answered. I don't want to open to debate. Uh, councillor, sorry, Councillor Canola, I didn't see you. Thank you. Uh, look, just quickly, I mean, the, the feeling I get is uh, we're trying to administrate our way to some sort of solution and truly, uh, if we work within consultation, as we, I'm sure, we, as, as what I gather here, we've consulted the people that were our rate payers much more direct, but not necessarily those that have a, have a you know, they, they work in the, in the area. So they are part of the community, they're not just part of the community that you would normally interact with. I consider it is important that I think we give them opportunity because we're giving permits so people can do day parking. Well, if we're going to do that, then why do we make another level of administration? See if we can see what the need is because the extremities of the <coughs> suburb, and I mean, if you're looking at uh, Bundy's Road, etc. Councillor Canal, just yeah. clear answer to what members of views are reversal and also the other one. I don't need to debate it. Just okay. a yes, no. Anyway, so yes, uh, to, to reverse it with consultation and to see so that you're doing minimum amount with that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really the other is uh, yes. to continue on with the, with the parent right. trial. We find it as you go. Thank you. That's very clear. Um, any other councillors would like to answer that question? Councillor O'Brien, is that no? Councillors, I have a quick uh, remark just with regards to if there's no other feedback. I'll oh, sorry, Councillor Martin, go ahead. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions first. Um, it was the intention of council to grant permits to every residential address or dwelling and the 1,200 permits would be made available to people in houses, townhouses and in apartments and included. Now, this didn't happen because the administration decided to apply an interpretation to dwelling. Can you take me through that? Um, through the Chair, our interpretation of dwelling was based on how it's currently defined in the residential permit criteria. What we are recommending as part of this, um, mm. this workshop is that there is the opportunity if Council wish to expand the criteria to include um, more, you know, apartments and multi-dwellings. Okay, so um, the, the current situation, and correct me if I'm wrong, but with the Council administration and interpretation, the current situation is that on-street parking permits are possible for residents with pre-1976 buildings on Torrance titles, providing they have no off-street parking. On-street permits for post-1976 buildings on Torrance titles with no more than one off-street parking space. On-street parking permits for dwellings, that is apartments and townhouses built pre-76 on strata, strata titles, provided they have no off-street parking, but on the other hand, no entitlement to an on-street permit if you live in a post-76 dwelling that is an apartment or a townhouse on a strata title, whether or not it has no off-street parking. Is that pretty much it? As outlined in the pre-reading. Okay, no, I think that's understandable. Um, look, um, I, I agree with Councillor Moran, the solution to this is to ensure that those who live and work there and who have genuine need have access to override permits. That has always been my view. The proposed changes on page 22 are not going to work. Um, uh, I and Councillor Moran know the pain points and this ain't the best of them. It's a start, it's a start, but it's not going to fix everything. And in fact, if the administration would talk to local councillors, we could help them understand it. 
So my answer is um, yes, do that um, uh, with the permits, extend them. It doesn't require consultation as the administration says. It was council's clear intent that permits be made available to people in torrent title houses, in strata title apartments, in strata title townhouses and torrent title townhouses. That was the clear intent. It doesn't require another consultation, just action. And in the second respect, in relation to uh, uh, winding it back, no, just give people permits. Mm. That is the easiest way to fix it. Thank you, Councillor uh, Martin. Um, look, I've, uh, I think it's important that we take the opportunity to hear, we have a representative here from the Women and Children's Hospital. Um, and I think it's important that question, if uh, any of the administration has any uh, questions to actually ask, uh, we really thank you for your time today. If you'd like to join us and take a seat at the front. Thank you, uh, Phil, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. Look, um, you're welcome if you'd like to address um, the committee briefly for a couple of minutes of what your views are, um, because if we could educate um, our process, uh, that would be great. And then I might open up quickly to the elected members to ask some questions, if that's OK. Certainly, thank you. Bob. Appreciate your time. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very well. Um, certainly, first of all, I'd just like to uh, comment that we've had great success with the council uh, when we had Council Moran assist us uh, with 128 spaces out in McKinnon Parade. Uh, that resulted in a substantial change, a revolutionary change to the problems we're having with respect to our car parking. So I'd just like to acknowledge that was back in 2016, but it is, we're very grateful for what uh, council did at that point. What we've noticed, I guess we have to just talk about facts of what these changes have happened to us. Essentially what's happened is since the changes to the uh, arrangements, uh, we used to be able to have uh, people um, in, in our parking situation, they're not able to actually get into the car park now until um, uh, it reaches capacity at 9 to 9.30, whereas since the changes have occurred, it's 8.15. And now we have to have the police come to the hospital to actually direct the traffic. That's occurred on a number of occasions because what's basically happening is because uh, uh, patients and nurses can't get parks uh, outside, they then fill the car park. And so that has resulted in a significant, so I guess all we can say is previously it was 9, 9.30, the car park would fill, fill up, now it's 8, 15. So that creates a huge problem for the hospital and for the patients and everything else. I guess the issue that uh, we can't see how this permit system could work, um, because we have uh, 1,200 uh, outpatient appointments a day. And so how you would be able to determine which patients could have those stickers, I don't know. Um, in relation to the nurses, because we run a 24-hour service, we have over 1,000 nurses that could potentially require those permits. So I have no concept of how that could work. Um, and so, yes, we would have grave concerns about that because the end of the day, what we've seen is that the, the actual balance of parking at, the, at, the, at North Adelaide is on very fine balances. So what we did with Council Moran's help those years ago, we actually got an independent company that's an expert in, in parking to assist us over 12 months to come up with a plan that would actually work. That plan did work. Um, what we've seen since the introduction of this process is it doesn't work anymore. It's put uh, nurses in, in great uh, peril because in fact what happens when the afternoon shift starts, that's where the problem arises, they come in at one o'clock um, and they're looking, that's when they start and at that point in time uh, they can't find parks and so they're going to have to leave their patients to go outside to move their cars around because they're in two or three hour spots. So. Uh, we've had uh, overwhelming feedback from our, our staff, our consumers, uh, as, as since this uh, introduction has occurred. Thank you. Just uh, I'll, I'll open up to questions uh, uh, in a second. So just um, <coughs> though I'm clear, if you did have the opportunity to answer those two questions on the wall, what would your uh, response be? Oh, with respect to your business? Oh, with respect to our business, we have absolutely clear that we would want to reverse back to where it is because as I've said, because of the fine balance of what's here and some of these other proposals are, if you like, ideas, but they're not actually got scientific basis behind them. All we can say is we've got evidence, we record the car parks every day, we've got all the data to say what, what's happening. 
The only way I could see some of these proposals be looked at from our perspective is we'd have to re-engage some experts in parking to actually analyse what would, would potentially work again. Because I think the fine balance is such that if you look at what council did before with 128 spaces, that's made a huge difference. And so it's that sort of, that to, to us, it's on such a fine balance that if you then upset the balance, there's so many variables there. How do you determine which variable is affecting it except guests? You know, you'd actually have to do a lot more work on it. We can't, like the permit system uh, is very, we, 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 uh, we, we couldn't administer it. Thank it's you. just too much of a burden. Um, Lord Mayor and Councillor Moran uh, to ask a question. Um, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I actually think that you answered the question I was going to ask, which was, so really what you're saying is reversing the pattern control changes in and around the hospital and keeping the system that you've currently got, you believe would so resolve the problem. That was the decision of um, the last term of council that Councillor Moran brought through. The well, well, we've, so the, we've got the data that suggests that the effect ha has occurred in the way that was intended. Yep. And so therefore, I, I guess, we've just been experiencing what the consequences have been and so what we can say is that this is what this is the data i've got the data every day i've got the guys to look up the data since the, the introduction and before the introduction yeah. we averaged it out and so we actually were able to see what the impact has been and, yeah. and you you've had a couple of years to test that system and that seemed to be working it seemed okay. to be working it look, work, look, working it's, okay. it's, it's on a fine balance like yeah. in, in the sense they're still it's not perfect yeah. but it's certainly a lot, it, it's infinitely better. Like I used to be on TV nearly every few weeks yeah. explaining why we couldn't get spaces. And it's not like we have not looked at other alternatives. We, we can't, we thought about putting more floors on the car park. The problem with that is even to put, the, in that issue, we'd know we're moving. So to put more floors on would not be cost yeah. benefit. The other issue that we did have engineers look at that would actually reduce the number of spaces for a number of years while we did construction. Sure, construction so, yeah. so we're sort of stuck, if you like, in, in no, thank you. I think that's really clear. Thank you. Councillor Moran. Yeah, look, I've got a few questions. Um, if we did go back to unlimited, so you know, park close to it, by one o'clock, the free bus goes around there, what we would try, it, it's not really possible to go back. We, we, the free bus service has uh, changed and it carries a lot more people. Um, I suspect that by one o'clock, if we did that, you would be filled with commuters catching the free bus. Um, the afternoon staff come in at one o'clock, right? So that is halfway through the normal nine to five day. Wouldn't it be uh, a better thing to, how many afternoon staff are there? There's about 130. Okay, well, why wouldn't it be more possible? There's still quite a lot of room um, along Kim and Cradle and Parkland side where we've given your nurses parking already, and some of those would be afternoon nurses, wouldn't they? Anyway, what if we increase that by 100? Would that not uh, equally solve it? Um, and a safer well, I think, solution? Well, certainly, if there was another 100 spaces on the table, I think yeah. we would be able to sit down and analyse that. Um, and We'd have to think through yeah. the logistics. Yeah. One of the issues we've also got is uh, staff safety, and so what we would do, what we've we've done with the, the system that's set yeah. up, we've put people that are on night shift, uh, encouraging them to use the car park. Yeah. The McKinnon Parade one is, in a sense, been a masterstroke because yeah. essentially what that's done is meant that people that were going into the car park in the morning, we've said we have administered a good process with that. We've said if if you are only going in there yeah. in, in, the, in the day, yeah, so that and, was, and that gets them out. Yeah. So that was annexed for a member of the discussion. So that was kept for the night staff who yeah. really are in danger going back to their cars. Correct. So we're really just talking about the. Is that still the case, or is it? Yes, still no, no. Well, no, we, the night we, staff we, we've got, well, The night staff come into the car park because the day staff park out in McKinnon Parade. Is right. it? Because what we wouldn't have um, staff walking out so, there. So at that's night. right. So one yeah. o'clock, you've still got morning staff. They're taking those car parks. Yes. So you need uh, approximately a hundred extra on street. I would rather. This is my. Yeah. Point, I would rather give you more car parking and, and a permit system yeah. than open it up because I think eventually, because of the nature of North Adelaide becoming busier and the efficiency of the free bus becoming more efficient, that you'd eventually find that your afternoon nurses 
parking, unlimited parking spaces that you want back. You may be, uh, not, not get what you wish, wish for, but it might not work, that they will be filled with commuters. I think what you're suggesting we could certainly model, and I think... It's so you said that might be an alternative. I, I, think, I, think, I think if there was 100 spaces yeah. on, the, on the table, we'd, we'd be very grateful to talk it through. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, any other questions? Yep, please go ahead. Thank you for your time, by the way, I appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you, I appreciate um, you coming in tonight. I just want to also, we've heard how it's affected the nurses, and thank you for that. How about uh, parents that oh, come and visit their yes, children? Yes. So has the commuter parking, that not, that not being there anymore, affected them yes, as well? Yes, because the the car, what happens is, as we're saying, the car park is in full at 8.15, so people have got early morning appointments. They're scurrying around, like our consumers are complaining as well. Um, so I think the issue is what well, we need a circuit breaker. We need some way, like we did with 128, like we've just been talking about. We need more spaces, and then we need a lever to get keep people out of the actual car park. Uh, and if we had another 100 spaces or whatever is possible marked out, that would just be, a, a, I think, a significant improvement. I think what we would need to do, what we did back when we did it in 2015, was we actually did a trial, what we actually count to work with council uh, collaboratively to sort of figure out what would work, and then we had an assessment done, did an evaluation of it, and then it went to full council to actually get it approved. So I guess my thought would be that if there was um, an appetite to look at this, then what I would recommend is that we look at some sort of trial where we talk to administration to figure out what it would look like put a defined period of time on it, we'd go back and need to do our work on the how we would administer it, make sure that it was clear. We also, uh, because there's been so much union involvement and one of our stakeholders, we need to talk to our, our union people as well. It's not just a straightforward process no, to get all what they bring. It's very complicated. It is quite complex. Very complicated. So, so if we if it, we read it back, it would just solve the whole problem. It wouldn't have any issues, everything would be, it was flowing. Well, I can only, according flying. to my data, yes. Yeah. That, that was uh, that was correct. But my, um, my, but my thought of this line of questioning as well, Council, is because at the end it's your decision. You need to look at the whole North Adelaide as a as a suburb that is impacted as well. Obviously, taking into account your feedback is really crucial because you're a very important stakeholder in the area. But there's also schools and other establishments that are also impacted. So. Be it that that's the case, um, I'm mindful of your time and really appreciative that you've been here this whole. So, if there's any final questions, thank you, Councillor Dolman. Did you have a question, Councillor? Yes. So, Councillor Ho, next after Councillor. Just a super quick one. Thanks very much for coming in. Um, do you offer any incentives for carpooling or any other alternative methods, knowing the car parking is always going to be yes, issue to we, some we, degree? Yes, that, that was part of the trial, and certainly we are very keen to be continuing to look at that. We actually worked with the in fact, City Council had a few years ago a trial in that basis. Uh, unfortunately, despite the incentives, um, it was not taken up. Um, um, I'm not sure of the reasoning specifically, um, but Adelaide people seem to have a, a philosophy that they're going to get in the car and pull up next to where they uh, need to get out, uh, as opposed to um, the pressure in the eastern states. We looked at, uh, did a lot of work uh, with Sydney and places like that, but the parameters there are quite different in terms of uh, carpooling. But certainly we ex explored that thoroughly. The only thing that did work was the 128 spaces. Thank you. Councillor Hoare, final question? Hi. Uh, yes, thank you for coming. Uh, I mean, your, I see your answer has given me the direction about what I should do. Uh, I, I, my question here is like, whether or not we have the other representative from other hospitals and the schools, because like, you know, like, like you said, sure, we, okay. need to, we need to listen to others as well. Okay, I can ask the administration, have anyone been invited to address this meeting at all or expressed interest in addressing a meeting of council? Um, we've had feedback from um, St Dominic's Priory as well as um, Calvary Hospital, which has been incorporated in the um, in the pre-reading. Um, so the feedback from Calvary Hospital is that um, the challenges their nurses are experiencing, or their hospital staff, not just nurses, I should say, um, are experiencing are having to move their car. So they're now having to park in um, time limited spaces and so they're having to move their car during their shift um, and, and they have similar feedback from their patients, especially those patients who might need to have longer um, visits to the hospital. So they're finding it hard to find parks um, 
of a longer duration, which they weren't prior to the trial. So um, that's the feedback from Calgary Hospital. And essentially the St Dominic's Priory feedback is very similar. So that um, their, their stakeholders are finding it hard to find parks where they were before. So they're all happy that like, if we reverse the feedback uh, they haven't specifically um, asked for that, but I guess that's why we're suggesting what we are, which is that we would um, let, acknowledge that it, that changes have made had some unintended consequences and change them back in those locations where they're impacting those stakeholders. Thank you. Uh, look, I might have to. Uh, any other questions? Sorry, Councillor. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for that. And to <coughs> Councillor Moran's point of putting, as yeah, she says, 100 spaces on the table, um, and, and notwithstanding, we'd have to consider other parties, including other hospitals. Um, how, as an illustration, because I'm still not quite certain how it works, how do you allocate those spaces, those 128 spaces? And, and are they paid? Do the yeah, yes, staff pay? The staff pay um, $7, and uh, the hospital board's actually $7.60 uh, now. And we reached an agreement with the council where we pay $2 toward it to it as part of the agreement as the hospital. And would there be any issue uh, if those 100 spaces on the table were of a similar nature? That is a, a part paid. I would need obviously to get to take further approvals on this, but I think the concept is very attractive uh, in terms of, of an option because it then means that we have got more flexibility. The only other comment which I would make is when it's the when we have we've got the data uh, most of the time it's, it's full. It's only when it's bad weather then people tend to not want to park close to the hospital. But overall, as a strategy, it's a very it's worked very very well. Uh, again, I can only say on the experience that we've had with it, uh, what it means by exceeding another 100 spots, my recommendation would be we need to try, try it because this is such a sensitive issue for our staff and, and our, our consumers that I, I, I would like to be able to have the opportunity to see, uh, like we did with the other one, a three month trial, we'll see does this work and if it didn't work, well then we'd have, to, I believe, it's due, well, we're duty bound to try and find some other solution. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I did note I've been trying to get advice from the administration on how to manage this. Um, Phil did register earlier on uh, to potentially be available at the meeting to ask the questions. Um, I really want to hear from you, but there will be an opportunity uh, to present at council at a deputation next Tuesday, which is probably the formal way to do it. Uh, and in between, if you'd like to engage any of your local councillors, that's also an opportunity. Uh, council may want to also be able to afford an opportunity at a later stage if elected members want to hold some type of a public forum, if that's what they want to do. But uh, at this stage, uh, this is... I was just wondering whether representation is actually linked to the... So I'll, I'll check on that for you, but for now I'm going to have to leave it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to leave it here at this stage. Thank you, but please, please be in touch after the meeting. And look, um, thank you very much, Phil, uh, for representing um, tonight. Really appreciate you answering the questions, uh, members. Anyone else would like to respond to the key questions uh, that have been given to Vanessa at this stage? If, if you don't want to do, you've already done that, Councillor Sleeves. I'm not going to take it because we've been dragging a bit on this topic. Uh, Councillors, can I have your attention, please? Um, anyone else would like to answer the questions Vanessa has put uh, to us at this stage? If not, you can take this offline and communicate any other feedback to our administration with regards to this item. Um, any closing remarks, Vanessa? No, thank you. It's through the chair. Look, I think it's fairly clear. The, the, there's, there's some confusion over, over the preferred options. I think from here, we will take on board some of the comments made tonight. We will be reporting to council um, to seek a resolution. It needs to be something resolved on by full council. Um, thank you, Sia. Look, just, I haven't had the chance to respond. Um, and look, I'm still a little bit um, unclear about this throughout the feedback that we've been receiving. But I think there is going to be some aspect of reverse, reversal done. Um, I think we can't in essence, keep moving forward with sort of half-baking and bolting on solutions as, as we're hearing feedback. So I think a rethink of this is, is important. A rethink, a rethink may trigger a reversal or may trigger another option. 
but that's that's my view. And with regards to um, what members view are with uh, with regards to the expansion of trial permit criteria, I don't necessarily have a problem with it. I think the bigger issue is, is the first question. Thank you very much for um, your presentation today. Thank you for members of the public for also joining us. We really appreciate it. Okay, members. Um, we uh, we have been we have been going on for uh, for two um, two consecutive hours. Uh, would members like a quick three minute break? Yes, please. So look, I'll uh, I'll break a, a recess. We're currently at seven o five to return back at seven ten, um, and uh, yep, I'll suspend the meeting for the time being.
We are now on to item 6.4, the uh, City Lighting Strategy. Um, excellent. Members, CEO, can you add? Yep, through you, Chair. Uh, this matter was deferred from a previous council um, committee, so um, we've been invited these guys back just to make a short presentation. So Keith is going to lead us through, I think. I think we can consider it red, can't we? See, we've had extra time. Through the chair, I mean, council members, you can take this information as read and just simply have questions and answers and give feedback. That would be fine. Is there anything, um, given that you, you're with us here tonight, is there anything you want to highlight specifically, or are you happy to take that as read from elected members? Yeah, I think that is read. Excellent. Um, Council, Councillor Martin. I'm uh, just wondering, have we resolved that dispute about Louis Paulson versus um, Spider Creek liking it? Um, no, don't bring it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are working on that. Sandy, yeah, Sandy. Sandy Wilkins <laughs> is back in the building. But, but I believe there is a... you asking a question? Yes. Sure. Uh, and it is on that topic. I'm wow. sorry. I know it, at least it's groans from the veteran councillors, um, but it needs to be asked. Um, the, oh, it needs to be asked. Um, the spider crew. Uh, look, there are areas. There's McLaren Street comes to mind. Um, we had in McLaren Street uh, an excellent. Uh, well, we have a really wonderful heritage uh, street. So it's one of the, the best heritage streets uh, you can visit in Adelaide for its atmosphere. Um, because of the sheer number of smaller dwellings. Um, it went from being a beautiful atmospheric place to walk down at night into some kind of uh, military installation in sort of like, uh, I don't know, War of the Worlds or something now, or State of the Earth stood still. It, it is really um, incredibly bright, incredibly. Those fittings were powerful, obviously, manifestly, uh, not just in my view, but the view of residents that I spoke to uh, prior to getting into council, um, unsuitable for, for that street. Um, is there any potential for uh, replacement of those? Uh, is there a will for replacement in the administration of those fixtures in that sort of area? Spiders, huh? Spiders. They're really uh, yeah, If I would just make a, a comment, I, I believe in the context of those specific things, I think it's a more of an imperative that we actually do have a coordinated lighting strategy and it is our, our hope that we will actually be able to facilitate something coordinated across the city so that when we respond to these individual situations, it is in agreement with a firm position on what those principles should be and what is appropriate for those specific precincts. Yeah. Yeah. So really, really, my question is about the scope for this for this uh, uh, um, guide uh, to uh, incorporate that specific type of concern on behalf of uh, constituents. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Councillor Sims, you can ask about the lights. Yeah, thank you. And look, thank you for the report, really illuminating. Um, I uh, wanted to. No, and thanks, Councillor Kerry. Shone light on an important issue. Um, but if um, if I could just ask Councillor about Sims, um, please leave the, uh, if I could just ask about the status of the uh, atmospheric lighting on O'Connell Street and Melbourne Street. We did have a, a discussion about this at Council a little while ago now, um, and um, there was consensus from Council that we should look at that, and I know there's some real concerns around that within um, the community. Is that something that so, you've had an opportunity to progress? Councillor Sims, I think the CEO will, uh, will manage this one for you. Okay, thank you, CEO. Um, through you, Chair. Sorry, Councillor, I can't recall if that motion was actually carried, but um, we it have... Was. Yeah, okay, so we have been considering um, the atmospheric lighting, um, and I believe it will be considered through the uh, master planning uh, process for those um, precinct streets. I think what was actually agreed was that it wouldn't be done as part of the master planning process because there was concern that there would be a delay in doing so. And what was agreed was that we would get the um, quotes and, and options for consideration for council separately because there was a worry that if we waited for the master plan, we may be waiting some time. So councillors, let's take this offline. Yeah, that's oh, fine. I, I just want to flag that. Yeah. Um, it would be good to get that piece Perfect. of work back. Um, I might just give some general feedback on the questions you raised. Um, you've got on page 75 some key kind of questions for things for us to think about. Um, my view is that where possible, we should look at using uh, the atmospheric style 
uh, lighting. I think Rundle Street's a great example of the impact that that can have in terms of um, creating a, an exciting and vibrant atmosphere, but one that's also, um, you know, complementary of people being out on the street, enjoying restaurants and so on. Bank Street's another good example of that. So um, when we're looking at areas where there are significant eateries and, and a lot of street traffic, I think the atmospheric style lighting is really worthwhile looking at. Um, and also uh, sustainability as well, I think is um, obviously really critically important. So I'd say that's a key principle for me. Thank you, Councillor Sims. With that, if there's no other questions, I thank you for your presentation today. Oh, sorry, Councillor Zahn. Uh, just to provide some feedback on the principles, I think they, thank you so much for putting this together because it's comprehensive. It gives us that thorough background that provides both um, the, the detail in terms of the practicality of things as well as the creativity uh, as, as uh, Councillor Sims was just mentioning. I love that one of the principles is use the city as a creative canvas at night. I think that's brilliant. Um, and I love that you've gone through and actually considered things like impact on fauna. So you've got the full impact of, uh, of all sorts of um, a, a range of, of both uh, practical concepts as well as um, the, uh, the impact on, on all users of the city. Um, and I, I personally have been the uh, been able to enjoy the recent changes to Whitmore Square, which I understand have been uh, nominated for the Illuminating Engineering Awards, which is exciting, along with a couple of other projects within the city. So I think we're all seeing some of these strategic processes put into place and to be able to formalise it. Makes a lot of sense. So thank you for, for putting this work together. Thank you. And uh, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, but there's none. Yeah, just one quick one. Yeah. Sure, Councillor. Um, uh, and I, I do uh, I do appreciate all the different styles, art, and etc. Uh, have uh, Have you formalised a little bit more about the various precincts and saying, well, this is this is how we intend to retreat this space, and uh, you know, to achieve the the different outcomes you're looking for, uh, or is it still here's the various ways we're going to treat things? and then uh, we'll apply that uh, going forward or have you already decided some, uh, some sort of uh, rollout? Um, so tonight there's the principles and objectives and the victory forward and then we'll come back with the actions um, based on the feedback. Um, but it is more, we have both like designing our own ways to that and lighting panels that will form bigger decisions on lighting. But then there's also a panel for the for appropriate precincts. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We'll uh, move on to item 6.5, River Torrens and Torrens Lake Management. Councillor Moran. Moved. As read. It's a workshop. Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> Consider it read. Um, councillors, how would you like to deal with this item? Okay, so councillor, Lord Mayor, you're asking a question? No, yeah, well, I was going to answer your question. Yep, how would you like to deal with the item? It's on page 78, there are three questions that yep. we can answer. So, firstly, would you like me to take this read? Um, administration, are you happy with this to be taken as read at the stage? Is there anything you'd like to highlight in a report for the council or administration for a committee? Um, no, through the chair, I think probably the presentation is Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, there's key questions there for the administration for the elected members to answer. So I'll hand over to the Lord Mayor to start. Thank you. Um, I thought it was a great paper. Um, I really enjoyed reading this one. Um, and I do actually think that the wetlands, as proposed, the, six, the chain of six wetlands would be a fantastic way to both look at the water quality and what we need to do, plus aesthetically in terms of how we treat the Rift Bank and its connection. Um, um, I have actually had uh, several discussions on this as well in terms of Council's role. And again, there's been so many groups that have come together, but I do think it needs to be a, a, a joint endeavour uh, alongside uh, the state government, the EPA, the NL, um, NRM, 
uh, and the adjoining councils because of course the flow of the water can go further up and further down the river and so we probably need to round table in the first instance and work out um, how we sort of do a governance arrangement and what the contribution is by each of those parties um, but I think that would be great for us to certainly um, lead with this information and actually uh, put it forward uh, with a view that those wetlands can be done over um, a couple of years. I think that would be great. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Martin. Just a, a quick one related to governance um, uh, and I have read the document I understand the various iterations of organisations responsible for the river. Nevertheless, REPAC is the Riverbank um, principal advisory body to government these days. Um, why is there no um, uh, proposal to incorporate REPAC in this whole process? Because it is within their uh, ambit um, to erect anything they wish within the, uh, the torrents, is it not? Through the chair, I can, um, maybe we'll get. Um, you're right, REPAC is a, is a key agency. I think it's in a state of build at the moment. Um, it has not yet formed fully. I think there is some movement underway at the moment. When that occurs, I was planning to report back to Council on the status of REPAC. I think um, it is something that's not able to be included at this time because it doesn't really function. As it does, I think it needs to be incorporated in future thinking. We, we shouldn't wait until we find out what exactly their aspirations are. The, I think we should continue on, and as it comes on stream, we should consider at that time. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Any other questions, Councillors? Councillor Kiros. Thank you, Chair. I just want to acknowledge the great work that you have done. It's a, a really enjoyed reading that, but um, I would like the Adelaide City Council to be leaders in this. And um, I understand that there is a lot of stakeholders involved, involved in getting this done, but I would like us to be leading this and pushing it forward. Um, River Trans is such an important community. I just don't want us to lose sight of that. And uh, yeah, it's basically where I think we should be positioned in this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kuros. Any other questions, Councillors? Be it that there's Councillor Dunham, you always come in at the last second. No, no, like, no, literally, no, it's like no, waiting. I'd like to hear everyone else's perspective to come to shape things. Please go ahead. Um, thank you very much. That was a really interesting read. Uh, and I wholeheartedly endorse the ideas put forward in terms of the wetlands. Um, I think it also helps us then to really recognise that it is a resource. And at the moment, I think we just think about it as a bit of a, for the most part, a bit of a recreational um, aesthetic part of our city. But I think this helps us to recognise it as a resource, environmental resource, as well as a recreational resource. And then by bringing some governance into it, it also, as you've indicated throughout the report, helps us to link to other um, key outcomes, like considering uh, how this might play some role in um, sensitive water or water sensitive urban design and, uh, and the possibility of the water sensitive city projects. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a, a great piece of work and definitely one that we should be moving forward with. Thank you. Thank you. Councillors, excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation for your time. <coughs> I appreciate it. We'll move on to item 7.2, the e scooter trial update. Um, Councillors, just one second. Thanks. Chair, so we, we have a recommendation before us, Councillor. I wanted to move a variation. Sure. I, I think it's on the screen. screen. Um, could I also add in um, for an additional, it says three months, could I change that to six months? Is that the only change you're going to have? No, that's the only change, yeah. Just one second. Yeah, so we'll need to end March. Oh, sorry, we'll need to change the date appropriately to that would be April. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah, that's I'm oh, sorry, I was waiting for you to say it was okay. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Just, you have, yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. So, Councillor Martin's your second, please go ahead and speak. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Chair. Look, um, this is a, a variation on what's been recommended. The first relates to the uh, extent of the um, 
trial. The reason why I'm proposing that we extend it from three months to six is I'm cognizant of the fact that the last three months have um, coincided with winter um, when there has been a significant reduction in use of the, um, the scooters. And I think in fairness to the businesses that have been operating during this time, they've probably found it difficult to operate during winter. It's been a long and cold winter. So I think giving them a few extra months to give us an opportunity to get a bit more data, give them an opportunity to um, get more of a sense of how things are operating here in Adelaide makes sense. Um, so that's why I'm proposing uh, six rather than simply three. The uh, additional point 2.4 is requesting that administration convene a round table with representatives from interest of council surrounding the city to discuss the potential for a uniform approach to e-scooters in their areas. I know that there's been discussions happening in places like Norwood, St Peter's, places like Unley. Um, it would be fantastic to bring all of those councils together and to talk about how we might have a shared approach so that uh, commuters can move seamlessly throughout the outer city area into the CBD. Um, but for that to work effectively, we need to make sure that we have a shared approach to regulations, shared consultation with the government around permissions and, and so on. So that's why I'm suggesting a round table to bring all of those councils together. Um, I think that would be a really great thing in terms of encouraging alternatives to cars and transport in the city. So uh, that's the rationale for, for the uh, variation. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Martin. Um, he always speaks such sense. Well, I'll reserve my right. By the way, we can't. Wish, wish we all spoke sense. Um, <laughs> we do. Yeah. We do. Councillor Kira. Here we go. Thanks. Um, <laughs> here we go. Um, uh, look, I think it's a laudable uh, goal to have a seamless transition. I think if people, um, if the demand is there for people use to, for, to use this as a more of a longer um, scale transport option than a short um, scale option, that should be um, facilitated. I have a question though as to whether administration, um, I think I can foresee potentially issues. The big one obviously is that um, this represents a shifting of jurisdictions, um, a shifting between jurisdictions by users and and so a, uh, a, a potential problem of accountability as it moves between is does the administration see any problem with this? Um, do, do they prefer to move uh, more slowly, uh, given we're still in a trial period, or do they, are they comfortable with this, um, with, 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 uh, with this proposal as it is to have a round time? Through you, Chair. At, at this stage, um, we're, we're yet to consider how that might look in terms of collaboration with other councils, and we would be to a certain degree in the hands of um, the state government through DIPTI um, to administer and, and probably convene that approach. Um, but I think the, the general consensus is that we would be happy to be a part of that, which is not quite sure on the makeup and how that would come together. Okay, um, councillors, so uh, Board Mayor, then Councillor Carl. Um, thank you, Chair. I support the uh, amended um, recommendation to Council. Um, I do just want to ask to the administration, is there any difficulty with going from January to the end of April? Does that impact us in any way in terms of um, getting out our um, guidelines and, and the next DOI? Uh, no, it doesn't, on the contrary just to enable us more time to be a bit more diligent in that, I would suggest. Um, no, I'm not against the secondary part of the motion. It just asked the question to the, the extension. And it's just, I suppose, it, what is it we're trying to achieve with the extension? Because this is taking it through the summer period and that does give enough time. The, the, uh, it, it, what are we, because the, uh, what is our intention for after? The question first is, uh, I take it the, the two proponents have been, uh, the two, uh, two licensees have been doing their right thing and they've been uh, certainly, uh, they've been complying with the requirements, etc. But the next question is, if we're going to open this up at a, afterwards to then more competition or have you want to do that, um, uh, it's like with the first uh, uh, scooters, 
no, we've, we finished that because of the issues there. Now we have these two. It's just, uh, if we're going to talk about competition, my question is, the longer the period, et cetera, the more entrenched the two, the less, you know, the less competition will be able to do, uh, come in and, and take part, because uh, you already uh, had a much longer period for them to, uh, you know, to get established. And then, you know, I'm just thinking a bit about that. And if we are going to do that, great, but uh, it just means the next competition is going to have a lot of job to try to be competitive. You're just commenting there? I mean, it's, it's just, just putting it there. It's Thank you. six months. I might ask a question if no one else wants to speak directly. Is that all right? Okay. Um, just with regards to item 2.1, I support this. Um, I just have one issue that I'm trying to reconcile. When we decided to go out on a six month um, basis on a trial with two preferred uh, operators, which is Ride Scooter and Beam, we've excluded line from the process um, with uh, a very clear uh, public position that there will be an opportunity for them and for other companies to be able to come back on board through an EOI process around this time. Now we are extending this for another six months, which pretty much the way I read it precludes um, any other operator that's been waiting to access the South Australian Adelaide market for a further six months, which I think is a very unfair process, uh, especially if some of those operators have been banking on an opportunity through an EOI process to enter the market around January, February, March and benefit from that period also. So I think we are changing the goalpost. Um, and I can't support item 2.1 uh, with that regard because I think as far as I'm concerned, the six month period is finished and we should open back up to the market and give the opportunity for the market to be uh, part of that process. Um, otherwise- I'm happy to vary it and remove the two. Well, I think the question first to administration, can that be done? Because uh, I'm not sure if there's an issue around recruitment uh, to do with this or any issue because it, as far as I'm concerned, I think the six month period is finished and now we're starting a whole new six month period again. So, so just a quick question with that regard. Is there a problem with that? Uh, through you, Chair, um, we originally deliberated on a three month extension because that's an, that's an achievable time frame for us to um, undertake and write the EOI process and get that out to market with a view to continuation of service um, post January 31, 2020. So there, there isn't a problem if we include um, other operators in item 2.1? Uh, we, we would still need to go through, we, we need that three month period to develop and go to market on the expression of interest. Sure. With a, with a, view, to, with a view to awarding to new proponents prior to Christmas with a start date of January 31st, 2020. Sorry, so I, I apologise, I just don't feel like I sort of understand the answer. So you're saying this has to stay as it is tonight. We can't, Council cannot include Lyme as a, as a potential operator for an extension for six months without an EOI process? That's correct. So those two operators went through an EOI process? The correct. previous EOI process? Yes, that's right. So, okay, so as far, the only thing that's not here, which I think if Councillor Sims wants to include, otherwise I'm happy to potentially amend this at Council, uh, is to actually trigger an EOI process in the next three months to give the opportunity for other operators to enter the market before a six month period. I think I'll just change the dates back. I think change the dates. Yeah, that might be easier. Yeah. 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 Well, look, if you're going to uh, default back to the original, is that yes, and your just intent? add the 2.4 and just go back to the original 2.1. So just can I seek leave of the seconder, Councillor yes, Martin? Yes, my approval. Okay, so can I get a show of hands from councillors, please, to seek to change this? Thank you. So we're going back to the original motion with still keeping 2.4 in addition there, councillor? That's right, yeah. All right, well, that's pretty straightforward now. Um, councillor Simpson, sum up. Thanks, Chair. And look, just to explain the rationale behind 2.1 was also I was conscious of the fact that we're heading into fringe at the end of January. I wanted to make sure that we had something in place. Um, but I, I totally take on board the um, point that the uh, Deputy Lord Mayor has made about what, not wanting to disadvantage other providers. Um, that's a, a very fair point. So I just impress upon administration the importance of ensuring that we do have something in place heading into the fringe season. 
Um, I think in terms of uh, 2.4 in this round table, it would be terrific to um, collaborate obviously with the state government and um, other stakeholders around having a seamless transition from uh, scooters from surrounding councils. Um, I think uh, that would really reflect um, the uh, changing nature of this technology um, and be a really exciting thing in terms of providing more options for people to come into the city. I should acknowledge that um, Councillor Hyde has got an interest in this and I know has been thinking along similar lines. Um, he sent out an email earlier today um, to say that he is um, also interested in this approach. So I, um, I encourage members to support this. Put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Councillor Martin, you had your head down. I'm sorry. Team Ellard yeah. supported it. No, I, I was um, just reading your Facebook <laughs> post, I'm sorry. Um, Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Um, wow, that's a good vibe. Uh, your wife says you are uh, uh, backroom dealer coalition <laughs> builder. I oh, know, she's, she's funny, my wife. She is funny, my wife. Um, okay, we're moving on to the next item. We move on to item 6.7.3. Yeah, Manchet project. <laughs> Council Moran. Moved is ready. Second. Move is printed. Um, seconded by Councillor Abrahamzada. Would you like to speak to that, Councillor? We've got an option there too, so we're approving option two. Um, seconded by Councillor Abrahamzada. Are you happy to go with option two? Go with option two. So you happy to speak? Do you like to speak? Uh, just, just briefly, uh, I'd like to thank administration for their work. Uh, thank Councillor Hyde for bringing this uh, to the chamber. Uh, thank the Lord Mayor for, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, collaborating with uh, with um, Councillor Hyde and also Mr. Greg Mitchell for the wonderful work that is done in the community to bring this into the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Ramsey. Uh, would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Moran to sum up? No. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Um, we'll move on to item. 7.4, City of Adelaide's submission on local nuisance litter control. Councillors, a mover, moved by Councillor Martin, seconded by Councillor Abraham Zede. Any questions or would you like to debate the item, Councillor? No, I've broken. Councillor Abraham Zede. Is that wrong? Right? Okay. <laughs> 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 would you, um, <laughs> would you like to sum up, Councillor? <laughs> so much respect, so much love today on my birthday from my best friend, Councillor Martin. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Moving on to item 7.5, the Adelaide 500 2020 declarations consultation. Again, I'll seek a mover. Would anyone like to move? Thank you. Moved by Councillor Brandon, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Councillor, would you like to speak? Uh, Any councillor would like to speak? Councillor Abrams, I'd to sum up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Are you against? Sorry? We're so, against. Can we go again? So I apologise. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time tonight. <laughs> Uh, members, um, that brings a close to the last item. We move on to item eight, council members discussion forum items. Okay, Councillor Sims. Thanks, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. I just wanted to comment on the uh, news that I read recently that um, Sydney has had its lockout laws overturned um, by the state government. And um, I was delighted to read that news. Um, because of the terrible effect that, that has had on um, business in the, the city of Sydney. I, I've um, always been on the record being against uh, lockout laws here in Adelaide. Um, in fact, I used to work for the Youth Affairs Council of South Australia many years ago. And um, at that time, the Youth Affairs Council was very active in opposing lockout laws because of the impact that it had on young people because what you find happens is um, you find um, that people end up being on the city street at a, a, all at the same time. There's a lack of public transport. They're then um, at risk. 
Um, and um, it also uh, creates some really adverse, uh, adverse consequences for business. Um, so I really hope that the government considers um, what Sydney has done and considers getting rid of the lockout laws here in South Australia. I think that would be a good outcome for um, our state and our city. So I thought I'd use this opportunity to highlight the issue and encourage the government to show some leadership and follow Sydney's example. Thank you, Councillor. Any other remarks from councillors? Okay, if there's none, I will declare the meeting officially closed at 9.44 p.m. Uh, sorry, 7.44 p.m. Feels like 9.44. 7.44 p.m. And I thank, I thank all members for their attendance. Members of the public. Thank you. Thank you.